Welcome retired filmmaker, George Lucas. Hello, I'm George Lucas, creator of Star Wars. Welcome to the George Lucas Talk Show. Lucas Lynch, today we are um, celebrating work of filmmaker David Lynch, the man. I asked to direct Return of the Jedi, and he refused. He refused to. Hello, Waddle. Hello. It's very good to see you, Waddle. Good to see you, too. George, as you said, today is celebrating the work of filmmaker David Lynch. David Lynch, famously a practitioner of transcendental meditation. In honor of that, right. today I'm going to be Zen Watto. Hashtag Zen Watto. I feel like right, I have been get getting that, increasingly hyped up every week on this show. I've been I've been on one, as the kids would say. This week I, I want to be Zen Watto. The kids say that. I've died, George. I died. I went to the cloud, I came back, I have a new perspective. I see the world from both sides now. They're very fine people on both sides and I want to be hashtag Zen one. 
Well, and of course, uh, we we do uh, we do want to pay uh, tribute to David Lynch today, and we're going to be watching. Wow. Even though our our uh, bodies of work, he did not join the the Star Wars saga as a director. It, it uh, has did not cross, George. But uh, we did uh, merge in a way. A, roughly a decade later, when I made my madcap comedy set in the early years of radio broadcasting, Radio yes. Land Murders. And David Lynch, together with his Twin Peaks co-creator, Mark Frost, made their madcap comedy set in the early world of 20th century broadcasting, in their case, television, for the seven-episode sitcom, which, which aired on ABC, The People Who Now Own Star Wars. Uh, they aired three of the seven episodes of On the Air, Yes. These are two of the zaniest comedies about tw early 20th century broadcasting ever made. So zany. So zany. Uh, both innovative. Radio Land Murders pioneered digital special effects that every film uses now. Every period film, every Marvel film, every movie is benefiting from what we learned on Radio Land Murders. That already and tech. That's right. Meanwhile, on the air, Single camera, no laugh track. This was this was in the age where when you took away the studio audience and the laugh track on a sitcom, they would call it a dramedy. Well, no yeah. one called on the air a dramedy because no. the laughs were at home and, and they never stopped about being silly. Uh, on the air called it once it's 30 rock back. Am I right? That's right. That's right. Oh, look who it is. It's the man from oh, another place. Yeah. Now, Patrick, I know you are a messy bitch who lives for the drama, but this week is all about Zen Wada. That's I've heard that. I've heard that Zen Wada is the new thing. It's trending on Twitter the, right now. The kids are tweeting it. It's a perspective change, and also Wata might have forgotten to refill his anxiety medication, and so now it's hitting twice as hard. Zen Wada. <laughs> That's right. Can I we have a lot? Yes, Patrick, what well, are you going well, I to want say? To talk about, I want to talk about uh, where people can find this if they want to watch. Oh, that's mm. right. very important because some people are already panicking. How do I find it? Oh, they panic. Right. Someone, someone uploaded a Twitter account. I don't know who it was. Someone did who it. Who could it be? You go to this is a bigger mystery than who killed Laura Palmer. We may never find the answer. It could be someone possessed by someone else, and, we, and maybe it never happened to begin with. Bigger mystery than who leaked detours. And by the way, that wasn't hey, it done. wasn't, it wasn't no. us. We That's didn't an episode. Record. We never had that. <laughs> well, no, we had it. We just hadn't oh, watched it recently. Okay. We, we have yeah. them all. We have them all. But right, we right, haven't watched right. that. That was one of the ones we hadn't watched recently because I know we but watched. It's, it's, to be clear, it's not in the Google Drive we share with our viewers. So it's impossible it's to never, never that was back an episode we shared. We always kept this never one near and dear to our hearts. Yes. Sure. But if I like people, to think that the seven months of beating the drum every week. Yes. For Star Wars new tours, I like to think that whoever did leak it watches this show. Correct, George. You gotta let me get this out. If people go to That's at right. on the air show on Twitter, you can find links to watch it, whether it's on Google Drive or on Daily Motion. I don't know who did it. Someone did it. It was really nice of them. Thank you so much. Oh, Very nice. kind. Such kind. We should, also, stranger. We should also say today we're we're fundraising for two different uh, organizations. Uh, right. The David Lynch Foundation, and because you know it's a crazy world and there's a lot going yeah. on, uh, we're also going to be raising money for uh, Feeding America, which helps you know raise money for food banks across the country. Um, so if you guys want to donate to Feeding America, you send it to our normal bit.ly slash GLTS gives, and we will send it along to Feeding America. Or you can donate directly and forward us the email. If you want to donate to the David Lynch Foundation, and these will pop up throughout the day, so you guys don't have to forget. You go to bit.ly slash GLTS gives backwards, you know, and then send your uh, receipt to the George Lucas talk show at gmail.com. And we will tabulate everything as a total uh, as to what the stretch goals are. Um, everything will come together uh, for the total number. Um, but yeah, so we're going to do both because it's a crazy time right now. And we want to make sure that it's going to good places. Yes, right. and we'll we'll be uh, the, the usual stretch goals, the, the charts, the spreadsheets, We'll be uh, keeping the totals of the Feeding America donations. And Patrick, can we pull that up quickly just so we uh, acclimate ourselves with the pre-existing yep. stretch goal? The everybody. Okay, yep. so Watto chugs an energy drink at 666. 
Now George has has killed BB-8. Yeah, I can't. There's no. That's impossible. I can't inflate something that I've I've torn to shreds. Okay. Um, well, let's we'll figure this out in a little bit because. All right. Uh, we should get started, and I want to bring in our first guest. Oh. Um, Very exciting. Is, is that okay? Is that okay with you guys? Yes. How yes, about absolutely. this? How about how about you put that one thousand dollars lotto eats a cent? Okay. You, you uh, know what? Oh, I eat the sandwich. I think regular viewers of the George Lucas talk show know what to expect when Watto gets a sandwich. So I'm just going to say, get your expectation. I comedy gold. That's what people expect. And and, uh, and at that one thousand dollar mark, hold on. At that one thousand dollar mark, how about I will eat my feelings? Well, maybe that should be a different goal. Maybe that's two thousand. Yeah, fifteen hundred. That's fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred George eats his feelings. Okay. Okay. I'm just saying you cannot get your expectations high enough for Watto eating the sandwich, but let's get started. Yes. Uh, our first guest for the first episode of On the Air uh, is an actor from the show, George Watto. This is exciting. This is huge. Very exciting. I, I'm thrilled. Zen Watto. He played, he played Bert Shine in all seven episodes. Please welcome Gary Grossman to the stream. Hello. How are you Waiting for him to Hello. Uh, thank you for being here, Gary. My pleasure. Gary, can you hear us? <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. I didn't bring my costume to dress up. I guess. Uh, hey, well, you <laughs> you are dressed like Gary Grossman, and that is that is costume enough for us. That is the goal. Yes, uh, Gary. So we're gonna start this first episode. I don't know if it works for you. I sent you the link. If it doesn't, we can just talk about it, and it's not a big deal. You know, I'm um, fine. I mean, do you. You gonna share? You gonna watch it here, or how you how are you we're, watching? We we each have the link. I emailed you a link to them. Yeah, I saw it. I saw it. Would you yeah, like yeah. To run the link or? To, yeah, to so answer your question, Gary, it will not be viewable in the main window here where we are talking. You have to watch it in a separate window or on a separate device, and people will be doing the same at home, just trying to. I got sync you. Okay. Yeah, I, I just, I'm Watto, right by here. the way. Great. So just turn the sound down, uh, and we'll all press play at the same time. Uh, let me know when everyone's good to go. I'm uh, ready, baby. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to... And then you want me to turn the sound down on the, the David Lynch, on the on the, on the the air? or, or yeah. The yeah, on the on the air. Okay. On the on the, on the air. And there's subtitles, okay. so we should be good to go. All right. You so we are going to press play. In one, two, three. Um, now, Gary, uh, seven episodes of On the Air uh, uh, were made, and three of them aired on ABC. Uh, I watched all three of them as they aired on ABC, uh, and I thought this was it was truly unlike anything else on television at the time. It would be a unique show in 2020, but yeah. in 1992. Yeah, all of them aired. On ABC. Well, not. No, I believe only the because I was there week four waiting for it and nothing showed up. It, it, they think they aired in England and other places, but ABC pulled the plug early. He's right. My wife is saying you're right. So then they, <laughs> wow. I remember the last time we were supposed they to be. We were um, uh, basically the World Series was on. Uh, and so that that was the last thing I remember. Right. How did uh, how did you uh, how did you get involved in the show in the first place, Gary? Um, I was invited to uh, a meeting with David Lynch. I had no idea what the meeting was about. I came into a um, an open. Uh, uh, what you call it? Um, stage. Oh, oh stage. A, a stage that had uh, that was empty, completely empty. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was led into the stage, and David was at the other end of the stage, sitting in a chair, and there was a chair next to him. And um, I went and sat down next to him. And we started talking and just basically was asking me about my life and what was going on with me. 
and um, all sorts of uh, all sorts of things, and um, and never. Um, You know what? I'm watching Radio Land Murders. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm trying to figure out where on the air is on here. That's okay. This is the classic. This is a classic on the air style moment. Yes. Yes. <laughs> there should be I, a. I, um, not us. It's not us, though, right? Yeah. No, there should be a folder that says on the air and it's got all the episodes in it. I got you. All right. Well, anyway, yeah. so I was sitting there talking to David. Mm -hmm. um, and we were just talking about different, you know, different things, in, yeah. you know, about my life. And I had no idea what I was doing. And at the end of it, he, he said, I love your tie. And I said, thanks. <laughs> and he said, it really is. It, it's really something. And I said, wow. great. I took my tie off and I gave it to him. <laughs> and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, you like my tie. Yeah. He said, yeah. I said, well, yeah. I can get other ones if you like it. I'm, you know, I'm a fan of David Lynch. Here's yeah. my tie. And I gave him my tie. And, and that was, you know, basically it. And that was the <laughs> end of the conversation. Yeah. And, it was at least three months later that my agent called me and said, you booked a David Lynch series. And I said, what David Lynch series? And they said, he's doing a series called On the Air and you're in it. And I said, did I audition for it? <laughs> And he said, um, well, didn't you remember you met David Lynch? And I said, yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah. And I said, what character am I playing? And is there a script? And they said, there's no script, and we don't know what character you're playing. <laughs> I said, okay, it's not in the contract. And they said, well, there's no contract. <laughs> I said, there's no contract and I'm in a David Lynch series. And they said, well, yeah. And I said, have we accepted? And he said, it's a David Lynch series. Of course we're going to accept. <laughs> I said, well, when does it start? And they said, they want you um, on, uh, on Tuesday. Yeah. I said, okay. So I go down there Tuesday to this set. And um, they immediately put me into um, wardrobe and makeup. And the person uh, is putting me in a chair and says, you mind if I cut your hair? <laughs> and I said, okay. Uh, he said, well, do you have any desires? I said, I have no idea what character I'm playing. And he, and I said, but, you know, if you want to cut my hair, feel free. Yeah. And so I was sitting in the chair and somebody else came in and said, um, uh, David will be by in a little while. And I said, yeah. okay. And then all of a sudden... David rolls past the dressing, the uh, the makeup room, and waves to me, and I wave back at him, and that was it. Wow! And then a few minutes later, the stage manager comes in and says, "We got to get you to the network." And I went, "What?" He said, yeah, we've got to take you to ABC to the network. <laughs> and I said, okay. And I've been through some of this before. And I said, what am I doing at the network? He said, well, yeah. you're going you're gonna to audition. 
I said, okay, I thought I had the part. And he said, you do. <laughs> I said, and I'm going to audition? He said, well, Dave will be in in a minute. So then a few seconds later, David walks past. And he stops in the room and he says, hi. And I said, hi. And I said, he said, welcome to uh, On the Air. And I said, well, am I in On the Air? <laughs> he said, yes, absolutely. I said, okay. I said, well, they're telling me I have to go down to ABC to the network to audition. And he said, well, yeah, but you're in it. I said, okay. I said, can I ask you a couple of questions? And he said, yeah. I said, well, what character am I playing? And he tells me Bert Shine. And then he tells me a little about who Bert Shine is. And that makes sense to me. All right. And then I said, he said, okay. They're gonna uh, they're gonna meet you in a few seconds in the front, and they've got a car, and they'll take you to ABC. I said, okay. I said, I have one more question, and he said, yeah, please. I said, if I'm auditioning, don't I need to have any lines? <laughs> and he said, yeah, you're right. Say that. <laughs> And he says a line to me. And he said, can you repeat that to me? And I repeated the line. He said, okay, that's it. I said, excuse me. I'm, I know you know all this, but when, usually when you go in, there's somebody reading with you and you have a large script. He said, don't worry about it. Just say that. Yeah. So I get into the car with the casting director and the uh, one of the producers, I guess, and we're driving to ABC and I hear, and I'm in the back seat and I hear that, um, that they're talking about that they would do at ABC an hour and a half ago. <clears throat> <laughs> and let's you know see if we can make it fast because we want to get Gary back for the table read. I said okay, and I'm sitting there, and then I hear a phone call happening, and I'm not making this up. I'm truly not. They are negotiating with my agent. <laughs> on the phone for my contract. And then I look down and I'm seeing a yellowed picture of me. And it's a picture that I had sent to this casting director maybe about seven years ago. And that's my resume. That's the picture that they're bringing into the network. So I'm like, I have no idea. This is like a bizarre David Lynch episode. And then I go to ABC. And you usually when you go into network, there's like several people in the room that you're uh, auditioning with or auditioning against. Mm -hmm. And there was nobody there. I'm sitting in this big lobby at ABC. They finally bring me in. Network uh, auditions are very cold at best. They, they, It's very distant. You can never see anybody in the room. It's always very dark. And um, it's kind of like, what are we doing? You know, and... So I walk in there 
Uh, what is Watto doing here? I think he's acting. He's acting out your story. I think he's like, "Where am I? It's so dark." I oh, believe oh, that's what I'm, I'm glad. I'm I have no idea who Watto is, but I maybe I probably should. I'm no. a toy dairy, and I own a junk shop on Texas. It, Don't worry okay. about it. So anyway, I go in there, and um, they introduce me, and they say, "This is Gary Grossman. He's going to be playing Bert Shine for." Um, uh, on the air, this is who David would like, and um, here's Gary. Yeah, and uh, they said, Oh, what do you have for us today? And I say this one line, <laughs> and there's silence. <laughs> and um, they say, Uh, okay, what else? And I said, that's it. Thank you very much. And I walk <laughs> out of the room. <laughs> and I'm going, this is insanity. I am being, uh, I am, I'm never going to be at ABC ever again. I, I have no idea what the hell I'm doing here. And um, I go back into the waiting room and I'm sitting there by myself. And then all of a sudden the producer and the casting director come in and said, all right, let's go. Let's get you back in the car. Um, uh, we got to get you back for the, for the table read. Yeah. And I went, okay, did I get it? <laughs> and I, I go in there and um, I immediately go into the table read, which is, uh, started already and uh, they stop to introduce me to everybody and I'm there with my buddy Miguel Ferrer mm -hmm. who's passed and I'm sitting next to him and I'm sitting next to my other dear friend Marvin Kaplan and then I'm sitting next to David Lander all of which I've been you know big fans of and and Miguel and I uh, study together. Uh, oh, wow. So we're, you know, we're kind of familiar with what's going on. And they said, um, and they passed me a script. This is the first time now I'm seeing the script. And I'm literally just working, you know, through this thing and trying to figure out what's going on. I find out about three months later, that David and the network were having a big battle. <laughs> and it's not a big battle, it's Hiroshima. <laughs> sure. And it's about control. And it's about David is, you know, is saying he's going to cast and he's going to cast who he wants and he's going to do what he's going to do. And that's it. And so he didn't bring in several Burt Shines. He brought in one. He didn't, you know, everything else was just there. Um, from what I understand, Miguel never went into network. Marvin never went into network. I don't think David went into network. Um, I don't know uh, if Nancy Ferguson or anybody else went. Yeah. I was the kind of the the scapegoat or guinea pig or whatever it was to go there. Um, the pilot, which is what you're seeing right now. Yeah. Was the best thing that I've ever been involved with. And in, in terms of working and working with David and it was a, a joy to be held. I've never in my years since have never been within a set and a, and a group that was like that because we were literally making it up as we go. I mean, David had, David is such a brilliant, I mean, he defies any meaning and he gets what he wants out of you. Sure. And it doesn't seem like he knows what he's doing, <laughs> but he does. Yeah. He, he gets what he gets the whole thing. So we were having this ball and I leave 
that experience, that pilot, thinking, I'm in heaven. This is what I've always wanted to do. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be in a David Lynch series. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be experiencing Twin Peaks and and, and all of and those be, crazy things. And to be clear, when you filmed the pilot, that was when Twin Peaks was on the air. Yes, that is right. That that is that's correct. And but to be clear, on the air was not yet on the air. Right, on the air was definitely definitely not on the air. And you'll and that's the next story about this. Can't so we start learning after we finish this pilot that this war has been going on. And that David, I guess, as part of Twin Peaks, had to deal with ABC mm -hmm. or a next series. Unconditional. And that was to be on the air. I don't know if the network saw the script, but all we know is that when they were doing the uh, network picks of what was going to be on the uh, air, air, the air, <laughs> and I was excited because I'm going to go to an you know. Uh, an on-air kind of whatever they call it, um, you know, for the series, mm -hmm. you know, where they where they introduce you and you you know you get you know the everything upfront. going on. So they're going to fly me to New York and I'm going to be at Radio City Music Hall and I'm yeah. going to you know be paraded out there and that kind of stuff. And I'm waiting and waiting and waiting and nothing's happening. And we're being told there's no commitment for on the air. And we're being told we're not being invited to the uh, announcement. And then I guess it was a couple of days before that's supposed to happen, I get a call from my agent telling me get ready and get packed. I'm going to New York. There's an MGM jet <laughs> that's uh, been charted and we're going to New York. And I'm figuring, oh, wow, an MGM jet. This is great. And they're putting us up at this great hotel and blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to the upfronts. <laughs> no. We're not going to the upfronts. We find out on the plane that David has put us in, uh, has booked a, um, uh, it's either a museum of television in New York or something like that where we're going to be interviewed. And it's at the same time as the upfronts are going on. And what is going on is David is pressuring ABC to get this piece on the air. That's what we're hearing. And, um, and we're hearing that CBS is in the mix and this one's in the, we're hearing all these different rumors and nothing is clear. We go to the, um, this interview at the museum and we're there and we're figuring we're all there and we're waiting for David to come in. And, um, David doesn't show up. We're all on stage and, and everybody's there. And all of a sudden the screen opens up and there on the screen is David. Hi, everybody. And he starts talking about on the air and whatever it is and introduces us and we all talk. And that's it. 
It ends. We go back to the hotel. We get packed. And we go home. I guess about three months later, we hear that we've been put, we've been um, uh, picked up as as a mid season, and um, and that we're we've got a pickup of six episodes mid-season and we we're, we're supposed to show up at CBS Radford and we start filming we go to CBS Radford the first day of CBS Radford and I go in the main door again I'm very excited I'm going you know I'm a series regular and everybody lives to be a series regular and so I get to the gate and um, I can't, uh, they're not letting me in. I said, um, where, you know, um, you know, shouldn't I be, you know, they said, oh, you have to use the back gate. I said, okay. So I go around, I go to the back gate. I come in the back gate and they show me where to park. And I'm excited again because I'm going in, I'm a series regular, and I'm going to find a parking spot with my name on the parking spot. And I go, and it says in pencil on a piece of paper that was basically tagged <laughs> on the spot, it says Gary. Just Gary? That's it. Just Gary. Could be for anybody, but it's Gary, I think it is. And then there's one that says Miguel, and there's one that says Marvin. And so we're all there. So we go into the the uh, the uh, soundstage, and again, my first experience at being a series regular I'm very excited. I figure I'm going to have, you know, a trailer and, you know, like I, you know, I had with Bachelor Party and maybe even a double banger. Who knows what the heck I'm going to get there. And they show me into this. Um, it's a wooden box. And it's a small little wooden box. And that's our dressing. That's my dressing room. That's my new, new place. And uh, I go meet ev everybody up on the set. And they were all talking about the same thing, that everybody's got these little cubby holes. And it's kind of like really, uh, you know, rinky-dinky. Nothing like what we did when we shot the pilot. And we go to the table for the first table read. And again, we're all there. And in the middle of the table is a phone and a speaker. And uh, the uh, other executive producers are there and producer, line producers are there. And then all of a sudden, um, you, hit the, you um, see one of the guys hit the speaker and said, David, everybody's here. And David comes on the phone, says, hi, everybody. Welcome to the first day. Um, uh, So-and-so is going to be directing this episode. We're just going to read it now. So we do the episode. We hear the reading. We do everything else. And David says, thank you all. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and... For all six episodes, I never saw David again, <laughs> nor did anybody else. Wow. Wow. He was in this big war with, with ABC. Yeah. And, um, and, and I think, and there was some brilliant directors, um, 
Leslie Glotter, yeah. uh, um, Betty Thomas, who's a dear, dear friend still. Um, I can't remember um, the other ones that were there, but they're just phenomenal directors. Um, and and an, an amazing cast. And then um, we were getting some of the greats to come down. Chuck mm -hmm. McCann did a, an amazing episode. And, and, that. and so it, it was there. And I remember the experience. And it was, it was because we were all buddies. And you had in this mix so many great character actors, of which I was basically just becoming one mm -hmm. um if i was uh i shouldn't even put myself in that boat but you know i was after you know next to the great marvin kaplan and david lander you don't you know you don't screw around there and then you've got uh miguel and his pedigree and you're going wow i'm just happy to be here and do this and we would pal around and we would go from to the next studio. Well, the next studio across from us, so you get where it was, Burt Reynolds was doing um, his series, sure. which at the time was Shady, uh, whatever it was Evening called. Evening Shade. Shade. Yeah. What? Evening Shade? Yeah. Evening Shade. Evening Shade. Well, anyway, we were joking with, because they had bathrooms. <laughs> I mean, you know, Ellen DeGeneres was on the, you know, on the lot and doing her show. Seinfeld was across the, the yeah. way, you know, we would run in. And so we would like the, the stepchild um, show that, um, that never really was. And you look back at these episodes and you look back at what he was trying to do here. And it was just classic stuff. I mean, classic, you know, television, early television. And um, he had put together the set and the props and the, the art direction was, I mean, these were really old cameras that yeah. we were using, that they, that they made work. And, uh, you know, all of this stuff was like vintage. Um, and when Chuck McCann came there, and even Marvin, because Marvin, Marvin had done a bunch of, um, shows like this early on, and Chuck definitely had. And we were hearing stories, you know, uh, that were exactly what we were dealing with there. Um, so it was, you know, m in later years, I ran into David and we joked about it. And, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've been invited to his house, you know, one or two times, but. I've met him, uh, you know, on the street and um, in some restaurants. Yeah. And I have so many fond memories. But my biggest distress is that he wasn't really involved other than the pilot. And I, I guess I should be thankful just for the pilot and, you know, and that experience. But um, but that was my on the air experience. That's That's an amazing story. Let me hear, George, actually, we yeah. actually have another guest who just popped in, and I want to bring you guys on together because I know I know you know each other. Um, you know him from on the air as Mickey. Please welcome Mel Johnson Jr. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. Hey. Hello there. Hi, <clears throat> I'm George. Very nice to meet you. Hey, George. Hello. Nice to meet you. My goodness. Yes. Hello, Mel. I am Watto. <laughs> Watto! Nice to meet you, too. And I'm nice. Mel. Yeah. Uh, hey. Well, Mel has his own stories there. I'm yeah. Sure. I do. How do I? Oh, here we go. Um, here we go. Hey, that story is amazing. That story is wild. Uh, I, I, I'd love to hear the full version someday. <laughs> yeah. The, what did you say? No, I'd love to hear the full version of that story someday. Oh, I got you. You were saying I made it too long. I got no, you. No, it was great. It was great. You were cutting corners. I wish I could hear every minute. Well, I wanted to get moving here. I didn't want to, but it's, 
it's a it's a wild. I mean, I tell the story as much as because it's it's the it's the quintessential quintessential acting story. Yeah, about what you expect to go in, and we're all kind of weaned at. Oh my God. You've made it. You're a series regular. Yeah. You're going to the network. You're doing all of this. You're going to upfronts. You're doing all of this. And nothing happens like that. Yeah. And yeah. the whole experience was basically like on the air. It was, it was, it was like, you know, the early days of trying to get something done. And everything was conspiring against you. Yeah, yeah. It's a. It was a true Hollywood story. That's what it felt like. It felt like a real Hollywood story. Felt yeah. like I was watching E for a second. Yeah, um, I do. I do hope that uh, you know th this. It's a hard show to get a hold of for modern viewers. You have to be a little bit. Uh, tech savvy and you have to be uh, you have to be able to look in sort of strange corners to find it but i really do hope that they find a way to put out a blu-ray or something because it would be great to get all of the different cast members to do commentaries to tell all these kind of strange and wonderful stories about what went well, on we, in yeah, making some, it happen some wild ones M marvin mm -hmm. uh in his later years and it started with um early on with on the air, Marvin could barely see. And Marvin had glasses that were probably about three feet thick. I mean, they were, they were just like that. And David had booked us during this on the air um, fiasco that we went to for the upfronts. He booked us in this David Lynch type um what should we call it? A uh, hotel. Mm -hmm. It was modern and had neon and all of this kind of stuff. And you could barely see. <laughs> and it was my job to basically watch Marvin. Yeah. Because Marvin couldn't negotiate this hotel. Right. And he, we would get it into the elevator, and the elevator would basically go dark, completely dark. And there would be buttons that would shine up in neon. And Marvin's like, I have no idea what I'm doing here. And he would be pushing that. I finally get into his room, which is kind of nouveau room, so it's got, you know... It was great. I loved yeah. it, but it was like three foot tall. It was like one of those places that there, mm -hmm. and Marvin can't see anything. We say we're going to meet down in the lobby to go to dinner. I forget that I need to go get Marvin. <laughs> Marvin says, I call him and Marvin says, I can meet you there. Don't I can meet you downstairs in the lobby. I said, okay, Marvin. He can't work the elevator. <laughs> so he finally decides to walk down the stairs. And I remember me and Miguel and he came down the lot. And all of a sudden we see Marvin way on the top of this huge staircase. And he's trying to come down. And we're going, oh, my fucking. We ran up to that thing so we could watch, so we could get him down the steps. Yeah. yeah. It was it was those kind of things. It was, just, it was a while. It was the, the Paramount Hotel. It was the first time. That's right. That's right. That anybody, it was that, you know, it was the Studio 54 guy or whatever That's his right. name is. That's it was right. Paramount Hotel. And each elevator was dark and a different color. You That's got right. into the elevator and it was green, dark green. You got into another elevator, it was red, dark. <laughs> <laughs> and you got into your room and it was a postage stamp. And then the art was like a, a, a picture frame up against the wall with, 
was, was it was wild. It was wild. It was, <laughs> and wow. we all the MGM Grand to get there. It was like the yeah. last night of the. I mean, it was wild. It was wild. And the only one that really loved it completely was was Nancy Ferguson. Because Nancy, I, it. I thought that hotel was. Well, I loved. It. I mean, being in New York, but it was just. It was like it was like watching. It was like being part of Devo for a moment. <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, every all the all you got. There was no marquee for the hotel. You just pulled up in front, and these gorgeous people walked out. And yeah. I, and and they open up the door and you just thought, who are these people? And they were like the doormen and the way they were all in gray bodies. Right. The women were in gray body suits and I mean it was and this was the normal hotel. I mean it was That's it was right. wild. It was the paramount. Yeah. It was the first of that kind of hotel and it was like it was a trip. It was a trip. Uh, wow. did, did, did you talk about the event and Here, let's uh, oh yeah. Let's, I, 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 Let's press play on episode two, just so we don't get uh, super far behind. Oh, great! All right, and I gotta, I gotta get off, but I want to spend time at least with Mel for a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mel, yeah. yeah, we were just, Mel, we were just talking about the the, the upfronts. Yeah. Oh, and yes. and and how we thought we were going to the upfronts, and we ended up in this museum to um, uh, where we were being interviewed. And David wasn't there. David came on the screen in back of us. Oh, right. That's what I was just about to talk about. Wasn't it? Yeah, yeah just like that. So you can finish up those stories. And then yeah. I talked about my audition story. And Now, that was the Paley Center, right? Is that the, the Museum of TV and Radio? Yes. Yes, yes absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes. It was fabulous. It was wild. I'll tell you, now, I'll tell you I, 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 heard, I heard a rumor George, about that event. George. George, let's yeah, press we'll play start. really quick, and then we All can right, talk. We'll press play on episode uh, two. So, Mel, we're going to press play on episode two, which I sent over to you. Just turn the yeah. sound down, and we should be good to go. Okay. Um, all right, so we're going to press play in one, two, three. Um, okay, go ahead, George. I heard a rumor about that uh, Paley Center event that when David's image came on the screen, it was upside down. Yep, that's exactly was, true. You know, and you know, And do you know why? Why I'll tell you that? exactly what it was. David, David did it. No, 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 it, was, it was David, but he was coming to us via satellite. Yeah. So he started the interview and it was sort of normal. And then all of a sudden, he started to spin. <laughs> That's as right. If he were in a satellite. And, he, and they had it rigged so his hair would go up, things would start to float. And he never commented that he was spinning in the air. He would answer the questions and slowly spin. It was fantastic. I couldn't believe it. Right. He was so on a satellite via satellite. Okay, you want to start this episode, so go ahead. Yeah. But didn't, no, no, we, 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 but didn't Mel, didn't you feel, I, I know I said I felt, the, the I, like, oh, my God, I'm going to be part of a David Lynch. Oh, my story. God. I couldn't and then, believe it. And, and then I'm going to be with the master. It was. And then, it was and, then we, and then we never saw him again. <laughs> <laughs> it was wild. It was wild. I mean, the yeah. whole experience was wild and wonderful. Kooky yeah. wild and wonderful. That's good to hear. Uh, what was your What was your audition like, Mel? Oh, it was one of the most. It was the it was the most unique and the only way it ever ever happened. I mean, uh, I got the call. I was going in for this, you know, you know David Lynch's new series. I said, "Oh wow!" And uh, they said, "Well, you have a meeting with him." And so it was in Venice, I believe, or it was some on the west side. So I drive over there, and you know, this is before everything. And I had this like, I said, "Oh, if I'm going to meet David Lynch, I'm going to drive my like." my little Hollywood car that I just got, this little 66 Ford, 66 T-Bird in mint condition. So I drive over there to the lot and they all look at my car and they say, ooh, you know, you know, because this is the only thing I could afford. Anyway, yeah. we go in and we have this meeting. I mean, in walks David Lynch. I had never, you know, I said, he's in khaki pants, a black turtleneck, you know, just David Lynch. And we start talking. And that was it. We started talking. 
and nothing about the script. Not we're just talking. Yeah. And then I hit the fact. I said, "Oh, you know, David, I'm you know I'm a part of this group called the Imagination Workshop, which is a group of actors, writers, and directors that work within the psychiatric community with skills." Schools. We were headquartered at Neuro UCLA's Neuro Psychiatric Institute, and I said, "In one of the people I had just started working, I said, in one of the people that I work with is married to the log lady." And he goes, "Oh, I've heard about this group. I love this group." Yeah. And we started talking about IW Imagination Workshop. Nothing about. Uh, on the air, and then at some point he goes, uh, "Can you cry on cue?" <laughs> sure, I can cry on cue. <laughs> I've never cried on cue in my life. <laughs> said, can you cry on cue? I said, "Yeah, absolutely." Oh. He goes, "Oh, great!" And we finished twenty minutes. Didn't talk about the show at all. Yeah. He, we talked about imagination workshop, the log lady, the you know, her boyfriend, the whole night. He was a rabbi, and oh and they, I went, I went, oh, okay. He goes, great. He goes, nice meeting you. I go, great. And I go, <laughs> and you know, this is the this is the days, no cell phones, nothing. Yeah. So by the time I could drive to a phone booth, yeah, that's right. and call my agent, she goes, I don't know what you did, but you got the job. I went. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how it happened. I mean, it was no nothing. And then, you know, usually if you have to meet these the network, you yeah. have to meet the network, and there are ten million people who are going up for the same. No, this was David Lynch. We went in. They were informed that this was his cast. Not sure. and, and you know, and there was no. <laughs> It was no, we just read like the first episode. We did a read through and it was the easiest job I have ever gotten <laughs> in my life. It was the strangest, you know, it was just, it was wild. That's how hey, that Hey, I got to run on my end here. I just Gary, I, I so heard from me. Good to see you. You're the Absolutely. best, Gary. Great to see we you, Gary. I'm glad we. I'm I'm so glad, Gary, that we we confirmed your theory that you were the sacrificial lamb. You were the only one who had to meet the network. Uh, that's a wonderful. That's a wonderful story. Oh, no, no, the, everybody met. It was just the, we all met the same way. The, the, you know, yes. we went in and right. they were just thrown at us. That's amazing. Anyway, I'm going to let you go, Mel. Um, you should try to catch if you can get in touch with my theater. I'd love to see you and 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 have more okay. to talk. I'll connect you two. Okay, yeah, great. If you great. can do that, that would be great. Yeah, great. I will do that. Love Please it. come back Please again, Gary. Gary. Come back again. Yeah. Anytime. Come back you. anytime, Gary. It was great to meet you. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. The, the thing I love about this show is when we do these kind of reunion things is being like, I'm going to connect you guys again. I'm going to hook you guys back up so you can be yes, it's so funny. It's so funny. It's really, you know, oh, my goodness. Yeah. I, because you don't think about the the wonderful little moments that you don't remember, and they spark a memory. Yeah, and, right. Uh, yeah. Now, what was? Uh, yeah. Go ahead, George. No, you go, Patrick. Let's do it at the same time. <laughs> um, who uh, do you have any Miguel memories or, or Marv memories? It feels like this. This is a stacked cast of like real pros. It uh, was. You know, it was so unique in the sense that it was the first time, really, that they did a half hour yeah. comedy without an audience, single camera film. So yeah. it was like a half hour movie every time you went in there. And then you had this talent. And I mean, you know, I I was just like, uh, every day. I mean, you know, because it was like you were on a movie set. We were in North Hollywood. Yeah. And at the Chandler Studios, and it was just, it was just a, a, you know, and it was Gary was talking about Marvin with the Coke bottle glasses, and I mean, you know, you sort of had to lead him around, and yeah, it, it, it was great. And then Tracy, <laughs> Tracy Walters, yeah, I, you're you're mostly with Tracy, yes, you know, and 
it was Bob the Boon. It yeah. was, wasn't it? I mean, and it was, you know, it was really unique. I mean, I'm supposed to be playing the assistant sound man. Of course, that would never have happened in the 50s. I mean, you know, black man in, in that role. Sure. And so it was so fun. And here you had a blind <laughs> sound guy. <laughs> and I'm sitting in there. It, it, could, it, it, it was just so unique. And then you had all of these wonderful directors that would oh, yeah. come in and direct each episode. And, uh, yeah. just well, now, and, and now, he, technically, Blinky Blinky suffered from Bozeman simplex, where he actually saw more than the rest of you. And and one of the one of the one of the things that I feel like it took decades to catch up with is the images that you would see when you, they would show you Blinky's point of view. Those look like when you're on Instagram now, you have the options to create. Those look like GIFs or stickers. It, it was so ahead of its time. I kept yeah. thinking about that when we were doing it. I said, either people are going to go, wow, or they're going to go, what? And what is this? What yeah. is this? Because it was wild. Yeah. When you, when you were filming, because it, it looks like, you know, you had your area that you were, every now and then Mickey would uh, would interact with, you know, he'd be bringing right. when he brings the device over. There's things like that. But like, right now, it's happening on screen. You're bringing a, a device over to a Lester guy that and saying, mm -hmm. "Don't, don't press the the wrong button." Oh, oh, uh, oh, yes, with the the and the because the the smoke will come out and kill everybody. Yeah, yeah. Um, but mo a lot of the time, you're in the one spot. Um, the did you were you filming? Uh, uh, like, would you guys have how? What was the atmosphere on the set in terms of did it? We were in one spot, but it was like the TV show. I mean, it was, I, I saw everybody. I mean, it, so it wasn't right. like we were off in a little room somewhere. Yeah. We were there, we were seeing everything that was going on. Of course, when they were shooting us, they were shooting us. Mm -hmm. But yeah. every, so it was like being in, in on the air and seeing So when everybody. you stepped into the world of, uh, of ZBC, uh, of the studio, it felt like you were in that real world. It didn't Absolutely. feel like it was broken into pieces. No, it didn't feel like it was broken into pieces at all. We were a part of it, and a lot of you know, and you know, since the it was so tight, we were there. I mean, because they would sometimes shoot and then move right to us, so we would be able to be a part of it and hearing it and all of that stuff. And sure. It was uh, it was quite something, and I mean, and, and that's because it was so cinematic. It was shot like a movie. It wasn't shot, you know, three camera film. So they were paying, you know, they're bringing us over there and all that stuff. It was great. I, you know, a sitcom was not my favorite genre, mm -hmm. although. Right. So this was like uh, cool to be in these little mini movies with these great directors. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, it was wild. It was wild. George, I should bring up a fundraising total right now. Okay. We are at $736 right now uh, oh. for both David Lynch Foundation and Feeding America. We're doing both of them today. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, so we're doing pretty good. But I also want to say we that haven't- That does mean, I, am I mistaken? Or does that not mean that Wado needs to go get an energy? Yes, Wado gets to drink an energy drink. That's one of our stretch goals, Mel, if we hit a certain amount of money. Oh, uh, that's- I forgot I do, to put my last name on my thing, but that's all right. Yeah. Uh, I do also want to say uh, uh, Jana Hochberg made pins for the show, and they're $30. It's a set. Uh, uh, $20 will go to the charity, and uh, $10 goes to obviously making it. But if you guys want to buy them watching, prettyokpins.com, uh, and you can find them. Or if you go to her Twitter, you can get it. Uh, but I'll bring that up a few more times today. I just wanted to bring that up while we were talking about it. Um, Mel, what? Uh, when did you find out that the show wouldn't be coming back? Because I always find that an interesting way how people find out about you know cancellations. You know, I don't remember. I well, I figured something was up when they put us on opposite the Olympics. I said. <laughs> Uh, if they're going to put us on opposite the Olympics, there must be a little something, you know, there yeah. must, you know uh, something may be up. So it was, it was like, I knew it was going to take us, it was so out there yeah. that 
ABC wasn't going to, uh, you know, it was just, it was just and, really. And there was funny. a long, there was a long time between sh shooting the pilot and when the episodes eventually aired, the three of the seven that ABC aired. Uh, right. Because it was, Twin Peaks was still on the air whenever they were announcing that this was the next show. And it was a full year, I believe, uh, after Twin Peaks uh ended before yeah, I, the... I, I can remember that I was just waiting to see what they were going to do when they were going to do it and when they were going to launch it and and then when I heard that they were going to put it up against during during in the summertime against the Olympics that was not yeah. Exactly. yeah 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 I also I also think in an interesting way I believe uh that uh fire walk with me the uh the, the Twin Peaks prequel film, I think yes. it played at Con like a month or so before on the air premiered. And there were all these stories about the audience's booed Fire Walk <laughs> with me. It got a, it got a, a, a notoriously like hostile reception from that screening crowd. And so it felt like in that summer, it felt like it was a rough time that after being really on the top of the world when Twin Peaks for me, you know, David was on the cover of Time Magazine and he was this sensation. It felt like in a, a very short amount of time, he suddenly was uh, uh, no longer in favor. And it, and it felt like on the air kind of suffered from being on the in the valley rather than the peak, if you'll pardon Absolutely. the unintended was, wordplay. Sort of felt that, I mean, like in, like you said, it was a year before it was aired, but it, but we, it was cast and it was put together right at the height of his popularity. And yeah. that's why we did not have to yeah. uh, meet the network. There were no choices. If this was who he wanted, this is what was it was going to be. Yeah. And, right. uh, uh, but it was so, you know, I was thinking, and I, you know, I'm sure Gary had the same feeling, you know, all of a sudden, I am in David Lynch's next project. Yeah, yeah. Twin Peaks was like, oh my god. And then yeah. uh, I think what you were saying, George, is that uh, it's we it, saw was a, it was it was a moment of low support because I, I still feel very strongly that this is. Uh, it's simply a matter if they pop this show onto any streaming platform that people have now people would watch it you know oh, it is one of those because it's a it's a it's a forgotten work by a major filmmaker yeah and doing something that i i, I think you know when pe did you watch twin peaks the return by any chance mel were you were you uh no i, ha I haven't i didn't get a chance to watch the whole thing i feel like in a way, the fire walk with me uh, as an ending to Twin Peaks was a very like it was a sour ending because there were no it, it felt like it was uh, it had gone back and we didn't get a sense of what happened after the show got canceled. And the Twin Peaks the return, I think, made a lot of people reevaluate the prequel because now the prequel is no longer kind of the sad ending where you're it's the end of a thing. It now is the bridge from the series to the third season. And I feel like there's a lot of comedy in a lot of very goofy comedy in Twin Peaks: The Return. There's a, a whole Dougie Jones plot with Kyle MacLachlan, which is much broader and sillier than anything on the first two seasons of Twin Peaks. And I feel like the 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 way people appreciated that, I think that would be the pathway back to really reassessing and people getting a chance to see and fully appreciate what on the air what he was doing. Yeah, uh, yes. which is like very silly, fun, crazy comedy. I just, I, it, the way we are now with all the different platforms, with Netflix and mm -hmm. all these things, and yeah, there is this audience that was not for this piece or on the air that was not there on ABC. I mean, especially at that time at, on Saturday know. on Saturday night at. You know, in it was it was not, and it wasn't in a block of shows. There were no other shows you could pair it with, for one thing. No. But certainly, Saturday night in 1992 was not where you'd put a show that you wanted to build an audience for. I think ABC was scared shitless about that show and didn't know what to do with that show, and that's why they did what they did with it. You know, 
Yeah, if, I hear if, very <laughs> big over in Asia. I think the Asians loved the. I heard that you know you know when it was released over there, they just yeah. loved it and got this is it. A, I mean, this is that a was, reproduction of the of the Japanese laser disc of on the that I have behind me. This this is a work of art. Right, I, the, yeah. Jap I think the Japanese loved it, and I mean you know yeah. it was it was it was so strange, but I had the feeling that. It, Twin Peaks was about as far out as ABC was wanted to get. You know, sure. I think you may be. I was working with ABC at the time because I had a show on uh, at the same time as on the air, which is the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. Oh, right, 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 right. right. Which also uh, didn't last long on ABC. So I think, I think there was a period where ABC was very on board with bringing in strong creators, prestige people, and then they realized, what do we do if these shows are hits? Then we're helpless because we'll have to do what the artists say. Uh, and I think there was an element of picking these shows up and then dropping them because they realized if David, if if on the air becomes a huge hit, how do you give a note to this show? How does the network give what possible? I'm looking right now at Mr. Mr. Zablotnik and his <laughs> subtitles. How do you give a note? Right now, it's a, it's a close-up of his toupee and a subtitle says, what is troubling you? What executive would even begin to know how to give a note to this show? You are so right. I mean, that was the whole thing. I, when it started out with them going, David, David. That's right. He's yep. the past. You do, I mean, they never do that. You, we as actors have to go through so many hoops, so yeah. many hoops. I mean, yeah. one meeting for 20 minutes, not even reading the no. script, not a callback, not a thing, boom, with David Lynch, prime time series, never happened before I think all things. I think it's no, it's no uh, coincidence that uh, when they filmed the season one finale of Twin Peaks, they didn't tell the executives what the final cliffhanger of Agent Cooper, spoiler alert for a show from 25, 30 years ago, uh, but Agent Cooper getting shot, they didn't turn that script. They gave the network a fake script and the network said, no, no, you can't do that. You can't trick us. Uh, and, I th and then the next thing you know, Twin Peaks was on Saturday nights that fall. <laughs> And I think that terrified them, the idea that they would not be in control of the programming. Oh, you, are, you are absolutely right. You are absolutely right. I, and, you know, the powers that be can be very vindictive when it's necessary when it comes down to it. I mean, you know, and I was doing a Broadway show with Bob Fosse called Big Deal. And, uh, uh, he had done dancing, which was a yeah. huge, you know, cabaret and all that, but he yeah. dancing yeah. and he didn't take any notes. He wouldn't take any notes from yeah. Huberts who were, you know, they were saying, you, you've got to have a book. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. you got to right. do this. And he said, no, 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 no. And it was a huge hit. Come along our show. And he did the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> and it didn't get. I mean, he he ended up winning a Tony Award. I, but he fought them up one side, down the other. Wouldn't take notes of it. And kiddo, the day after the Tonys, we won the Tony for choreography. He won the Tony. Notice we got notice. We got canceled. I mean, wow. so you know what? these. So Mel, what was, I think. What was, yeah. No, no go ahead. What was it like? I mean, what was it like working with Fosse? Woo! <laughs> that was, it was, for me, it was very interesting. He um, was very creative. He was very low key, but he was rough on his dancers. You know, he wasn't rough on us as principals and I, but he had his folks that he had just sort of in for. And I was, you know, I was not a dancer dancer, but he, but I was, playing the sort of the young ingenue, which I wasn't, up against a real 18-year-old beautiful girl. And he sort of had a thing, he had it sort of in for me. And we would we would not butt heads, because I wasn't going to butt heads with Bob Fosse, 
Yeah. But he would like, he would give me notes. He was going, he would, let's say, you're being mechanical. You're being mechanical. You're being, and I wasn't, I was, I was listening. To, you know, I was, you know, so in Boston, he would say that. And I just said one day, I said, you know, Bob, I'm not giving you what you want, but I'm not being mechanical. So you're going to have to say something different. Yeah. And he looked at me and he went, okay. And he did, and he did something different. And wow. the biggest thing though was real quick was that there was this one, I am in a soda jerker outfit. I'm the newest, I'm the youngest person supposedly of the five guys who big deal on Madonna Street. And uh, there's this big, there's one scene I'm asking one of the guys for his hand for his, his sister in marriage. And the guy goes on this big rant. And then I say, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. The only curse in the piece. And I'm sort of the under. I say that audience, big laugh, big, huge laugh. And then one night we come along and I go, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Silence. Death. And then Bob comes back and he goes, no, you got to hit fuck harder. <laughs> and I went, okay. The next night, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Crickets. I mean, I and Bob's coming back and he's going, you got to hit fuck harder. <laughs> I mean, I'm going, oh my God. So finally, you know, I'm terrified. I listened. What had happened was Bob had edited the speech before me, which used to be long and rambling, it now made sense. So when I said, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, it was aggressive. Sure. So we get to New York, we're about to open. I, the whole cast is in the front of the theater and I go down and I said, Bob, can I? And you're a jack and we're at the rehearsal. I said, Bob, can I speak to you in the front of the house? The whole place goes quiet, I, you know. I take him to the front of the theater. I said, Bob, did you edit Larry's speech? He said, yeah. I said, well, I think because of that, and I explained, you know, that they understand. And, and he listened and he goes, you need, to, you need to hit fuck harder. Just like that. I knew what I was doing. That night, because it was the first preview, I went out there and oh, <laughs> I went out there and I pulled way back because I was innocent. You know, I'm at, I was a, I was a kid. So when it came up, I went, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I mean, really innocent. Big laugh. Yeah. Big laugh. Yeah. So Bob comes back after the show. And I go, I'm in the dressing room. He goes, you didn't do what I said, but you got a big laugh, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, That's amazing. You know, I, we we had this thing, and I had a friend that I'd done the the rink with, the thing with um, uh, Candor and Ed, with Liza Minnelli and Cheetah Rivera, and he was in this show also as one of the dancers. And we were talking. He said, "Everybody thought you were going to get fired." I mean, because I we kept, <laughs> but on opening night, he came over to my table. My parents were there. And I saw him coming and I said, Bob, these are my parents. And he said, nice to meet you. And he looked at them and he looked at me. He goes, you have a very talented son. I mean, he did not have to say that. Wow, but, that's great. You know, that's he, he, you know, no one really ever, I didn't go at him, but they yeah. didn't ask him questions, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's good. So we ended up having a very good thing, a very good time, you know. Here, George, let's let's hit play on episode three. I do have a few more questions for Melba. So Mel, yeah. hang out for a few more minutes. Hold on. But I'm having trouble getting episode three. Hold on. Okay. It's still publishing by this person. Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe click the Daily Motion one. Oh, that's the one. I'm oh, then maybe go to Google Drive. Um, Mel, what do you think happened to Mickey after on the air? Um, he became a stage manager on on television and became the flat first black director Hell yeah. of, of live television. Because he, he was he was very ambitious. Yeah. And he knew how to cry on cue. <laughs> That's a good answer. That's a good answer. George, let's press play and if it works for you, you can catch up in a minute. because uh, okay. you also recently watched these, so we can yeah. we're good. Yeah. Uh, we all right. So Watto. 
Uh, we'll press play in one, two, three. Um, now, Mel, you're also, we should talk about this, George, because this yeah. is a sensitive subject, but you and Mel, you should be fighting a little bit because you know what Mel was on two episodes of? Oh, my goodness. Star Trek, George. Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine. Yeah. Well, that's okay. That's okay. Star Wars and Star Trek, they, they're both, you know, they have their I fans. love them both. I, I love think them you can both. love them both. Yeah. But and you know, would you just say you can? You can. You can. Of course you can. Of course you can. But we got to get. I mean, it's not my. It's not my thing anymore. I'm not in charge of Star Wars. But they're making so many of them. We got to get you in a Star Wars, Mel. We got to get you. Oh, in I, I'd love to. I, you know, I'd love it. It was. It was. They were taking at the time. They were taking all the Star Treks off the air. Right. So and I was a big fan of the series. So I spoke to my agents. I said, you know, we gotta, we gotta find a way. Oh my goodness, we gotta find. Right. A way. Oh. To Got get in there. And so Les Landau, who used to direct a lot of them, uh, was a friend of mine. We went to college together. But when he called for the, me to do an episode, I was out of town. And then all of a sudden, we got this call. The last two episodes of the series, they were writing this new character. And you, they said, you're going to go in. And if... You get the part. You're going to stay there, and you're going to go right to wardrobe, and they're going to negotiate. I mean, it was like out of a chorus line. Yeah. Because what happened was I went into the room, and the room was packed. <laughs> I could, I, the room was packed with these English white guys. I mean, everybody had English accents, and they were talking like this, and they were talking loud. I was going... Haven't these guys ever watched Star Trek? <laughs> no one talks loud. You have Star Trek speak, and everybody talks. Yeah, loud, you know? it's like watching Supernatural. The boys never spoke with a loud voice. Sure. Yeah. So, um, I started being weaned down. They started cutting people, cutting people, cutting people, cutting people. It was just I felt like I was in a chorus line. And they, <laughs> so we got down. Uh, Brooks was he was directing that episode so Avery. We, Avery, Avery and so we got down to where it was me and one other person and we went in and we did it and we came out and the casting director came out and looked at the two of us and turned to the other person and took his hand and took his hand and shook his hand and said maybe next time and I went, are you kidding me? Wow. And it was like, what? and we laughed. We had to laugh because that was like, it was such a, it was so, so tense. It got, I mean, from, the, from being weaned at, and then, you know, I had to sit there while they negotiated the contract. And then I went right over to wardrobe and they started doing that. And it was, you know, the interesting thing is makeup, they get their Emmys and everything for doing the guest stars because mm -hmm. the guest stars sit in that makeup chair for five hours. Yeah. The regulars have something they can throw on really quick and, you know, but here they are air spraying me every day on it. And, you know, and it, it really was, is. It's an intricate, like, let me pull oh, it up it was, again. It, was, it, it looks it was very, stuff, all of that stuff, like, it was not a mask. They would apply yeah. the cheeks. They would apply this and then fade in. And the hair was, oh, it was spectacular. And then the, and then the suit was made out of rubber. I mean, I was sweating so much that the thing was bubbling up. They were freaking out. The makeup was going to come off after five hours. They had me in front of fans and, and, and the air conditioner. Because the suit, and I sweat anyway, so, and the yeah. suit was, but it was, you know, I had a death scene. I loved it. I That's mean, you know, you, you know, yes. Now, now, huh? now, we would be remiss if we did not ask about Benny the cab driver ah. from Total Recall. We have to. We, have we to. must. We must. Oh. Attention must be paid. Attention must be paid. It was, <laughs> needless to say, a spectacular experience. Yes. Um, again, the audition process was wild. 
it was sort of basic, you know, you get the call. I didn't know anybody. I didn't really know uh, Verhoeven's work. I it didn't was know- the second American film, really. I mean, it was Flesh and Blood was a co-production, then Robocop, and then this, yes. I, I didn't even, at the, my first audition, didn't know it was an Arnold project. I mean, frankly, I had done the day before a audition for a black exploitation film, which will name will remain unnamed. Sure. And uh, I it was so horrific that I picked up the script for Total Recall and I started reading my role, you know, reading my, and it got up to Benny's entrance and it said, Benny, black jivester. That's what it said. Mm. And I was so furious. I took the script and threw it across the room. Oh, I, I mean, I just hurled it across the room. And then I went, well, I got to audition for this thing. So mm-hmm. I started reading and I said, get out of here. Are you kidding me? <laughs> this was fabulous. Yeah. I mean, the role was fabulous. I'm a sci-fi guy. The guy, you know, Benny goes through these changes. He's this, you know, it was you so... You know, and so I go in and I, and I, uh, I audition uh, the first time and uh, uh, Paul goes, oh, that was great. You want to come back for a screen test? I said, this is, you know, this is back in the day when there was still screen tests. So I came in the next day and it was just me, Verhoeven, and the casting director. And Paul was working the camera and it was on a uh, tripod. Mm-hmm. And so I started doing it. I had my scripts. I started doing it. And I jumped out of my seat when it was like, Benny, Benny. And he goes, oh, wait, wait. I, I got to take the camera off the tripod. He goes, oh, this is great. for it'll, This will be great for our film. He said, our film. And, I, you know, you know, you're an actor. You're going, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Hello. yeah. So the, call, the screen test was great. By that time, I knew who was doing the film. I knew it was an Arnold project. Didn't hear a word didn't hear anything you know and in hollywood if it happens it happens quick yeah three yeah. weeks go by i didn't hear a thing and i was so it was such a positive experience i called my agents i said could you check i never do that i said could you just check and see what happened and they and they called me calling back they said oh an offer is pending i went are you kidding me pending so here is the topper to this i get on the plane going down to Mexico City, because we shot the whole thing in Mexico City. I'm on the plane going to make this movie and I'm sitting in my plane seat and these two teenage girls come walking down the aisle and they see me and they go, oh, you're Benny, you're playing Benny. And I went, yeah. They said, we're Paul Verhoeven's daughters and we picked you. And I went, what? He goes, yeah, he showed us all the screen tests and we picked you. Oh my God. And let me tell you, it says to me, when I talk to young actors, I said, listen, you have no idea and you have no control. All you have control yeah. is what you do. And I mean, and you will do your best. And there's so many other factors that involved on how you get, a ca- you get cast. I sat there, I was flabbergasted, but the, the whole thing was like spectacular. I mean, Arnold was, he was funny, wonderful, no muss, no fuss. Yeah. He was, you know, like the first day of big shooting, we were doing the thing and I would go, hey man, you need a cab? And it was a two shot. And I had just started to need reading glasses. So he was fuzzy, he was a little fuzzy. So I moved back a little, cut. No, you gotta stay closer to Arnold. I said, okay. So we started again. Hey man, we need a little cab. I moved back just a little. Cut. Mel, you gotta stay closer to Arnold. I'm like, gee, I mean, you know, this is my ah! I flew it out. I go, we start doing it. I swear, I just moved back a fraction. I went, uh, <laughs> cut. Arnold turns to the me, he goes, Mel, you have to stay close to me. If you want to be in the movie, the camera's going to be on me. <laughs> and I said, I said, I got it. <laughs> We and that was how we start. It was wonderful. I mean, we did some wild things. He had some, you know, uh, you know, they it was such a big production, and that's why they 
shot it in Mexico Zane because they didn't have to pay no residuals. We're not getting a dime. Oh. Or, you know, uh, they sort of screwed up. So I got down to Mexico City like two weeks before I was going to start shooting and somebody lost their job. But anyway, uh, I was there. So I started driving the cab around, I, you know, because we had the entire studio. Yeah. So we would drive and they made tunnels. All of those tunnels were connecting the sound stages. So the cab was literally driving through all of those. So I learned how it was a Volkswagen chassis and two functional steering wheels. Mm -hmm. So the steering wheels worked. So to get these things to work, you had to know what you were doing. Yeah. So we did a we did we did this scene in which uh, I sort of just missed the mold where I'm supposed to go zoom, you know, and in the mold we call the that screw thing the mold that comes yeah. out that I try to kill them with at the end. So we're just about to do that. And we just go zoom. And so they bring down stunt drivers to do to do that stunt because you know it's supposed to be a close call. So we get down there and everybody goes to the set to watch the stunt drivers do the stunt. And we get there and we go, okay, action. And the stunt driver goes crash, crashes into the thing. One cab down. They only have three cabs. So the guy gets into the second cab. Zoom, crash crashes into destroys the second crib they are freaking out the problem is these guys came down the day before they yeah. thought it was a regular car they didn't know if you really want to turn the damn thing you had to go to one steering you had to go to another one of the steering and really turn it you couldn't go like this even though that looked great it didn't turn it enough so i go uh guys i can drive the cab and they look at me and they go are you, I said, I've been down here for two weeks. That's all I've been doing is driving this cab. And they went, okay, it's the last cab. So I get in and Arnold stunt double gets in and Arnold goes, oh no, if Mel is driving the cab, I'm getting in and we're going to do it together. And they're all freaking out that their stars <laughs> getting in the back of that thing. And we get in there and I go, we go, and I go, Zoom, right there, you know, and everybody yeah. starts cheering and cheering. <laughs> and said, Can we do it again? I said, sure, anytime, as many times as you want. So that was another one of the fun. Wow, that's the tea, baby. That's the tea. <laughs> it was a great experience. It really was. Uh, and, hmm? No, I was just keep, keep drawing. No, I was just saying, for some reason, that film touched a nerve with a lot of people. and. And you know they would all you know they call Benny and they said you traitor because you sort of you know you he really wanted you to like this guy and then when you he, had five kids to feed yes I had five kids to feed and I had oh, four wow. kids what happened to what happened to number five oh shit man you got me yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. what what was it like I mean you you talked about working with Arnold what was it like working with Quato on that movie. Working with Quato yes. was really wonderful. I mean, one of my acting heroes. I mean, uh, Rob Botin, he made Quato. And, you know, one of the reasons why this film is so popular is this was the last time a major film was not, was real and not CG. Mm -hmm. so it was real. So yeah. people, you know, and Verho Verhoeven wanted it to look real. I mean, he there was only one CGI effect in that entire film is when 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 Arnold runs through the X-ray and you see the skeleton. You know, he's trying to get them. Everything. My favorite, that's my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> so there was more. There was more CGI in Radio Land Murders than there was in Total Recall. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was none. So quite yeah. a. You know, Paul was so Rob Oteen said, uh, it's not gonna work on a human being. We have to we have to do a robot. And Paul said, Oh no, 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 no. That's that's a no no. We because you know, we'll be able to tell and that's really and but 
to make Quado look so real, to move it, he had to have all the mechanics. He had to have access. And, you know, there's a real person there. You can't, yeah. you know. So what did Rob Bottin do? He took his own dime. Oh, I like that. Built a robot, built the whole thing, oh God. put Quado on it, shot the scene, <laughs> shot it, built it, shot it without Paul knowing. <laughs> And showed it to Paul. Paul was furious. He goes, Marshall Bell, when did you shoot this? Who told you you could, I mean, who shot this scene with, and he was screaming at the actor. <laughs> oh my God. Because Paul thought it was real. And then Rob Bottin said, nope, that's a robot. And that's how it ended in the film. When it fooled, when he was able to fool Paul, that's how, and nobody knew that that was because then all the workings could make Quato be as yeah. brilliant as he was. Yeah. Remember. Oh, I mean, those lips. I mean, you know. <laughs> oh, yes, uh, George, I think you were gonna make a phone call. Do you wanna do that now? Yeah, let's go ahead and see how this works. Uh, George is gonna call someone. Hold on. This is a new segment on the George Lucas talk show called Let's Go Ahead and See How This Works. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it won't. Hello, this is Andrew Badalamenti. Please leave a message and I shall return your call. Thank you. Leave it. Hi, uh, this is retired filmmaker George Lucas uh, calling from the George Lucas Talk Show. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, maybe I'll try again in a few minutes. Uh, 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 this is calling for Angelo. Thank you. Bye. Uh, just calling uh, Angelo Badalamenti, the uh, uh, musical composer who, uh, of course, did the music for On the Air, Twin Peaks, many other uh, David Lynch uh, projects. Uh, and uh, so we'll see if we get a hold of him. We'll try him a little bit later. Yeah, was that that score was just I love oh. that score. Yeah, it was so out there. It's the best. It's so good. Yeah, um, and, and the music on the the theme music. There's more songs on on the air than one would anticipate. You know, uh, there's so many little songs. There's the Mr. Peanut song. Uh, there's the, the 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 bird in the tree song in the pilot where she you always have oh, Betty wow. pulling out the little the bird in the tree and it's a beautiful little song but also very funny in the context of the show. Uh, yeah, it was wild. I mean, you know, because they didn't air them, it's yeah. like you forget what the, and it. It was a while before I even saw the full, you know, uh, right. complex episodes. Yeah, because I think it was only, if I remember right, it's only released in Japan, right, George? Is that where? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I believe it. Yeah, uh, and there was a VHS release as well, but it, it, it's certainly yeah. like, um, yeah, I, I do feel like uh, it's t it's long past time to get this out there in a in a in a proper way where people yeah. can officially enjoy it because it's been this sort of a bootleg secret for most of its existence because. American audiences weren't even given the choice to watch uh, uh, four of the episodes, including the second one. You know, they skipped right to episode three. And, and uh, you know, I'm certainly in favor of releasing episodes out of strict chronological, strict numerical order, but it has to be this, the filmmaker's choice. Yeah. Right. And you see, and I didn't even realize that. I mean, you know, I was just, uh, uh, ooh, numbers are rising. Yeah. Numbers uh, are rising. Lotto, you get to eat your sandwich now. Okay. Ready? Are the folks ready? I got my energy drink, of course, a matcha green tea to center myself. And now, Zen Wato is about to eat a sandwich. <laughs> what do we got? Peanut butter and jelly. Peanut butter and jelly. I'm trying to respect my stomach this week. Zen Wato. Hashtag Zen Wato. Wato usually eats a, a very large meat sandwich and it never ends up agreeing with him. So it's good that he's doing a little bit better. Um, uh, Mel, are you in New York or are you based in LA? 
I'm based in New York. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I was born and raised here, and uh, I went out after I did uh, The Rink on Broadway and then came back and did Big Deal really quickly, and then I came back out. Yeah. And that's when, you know, I started doing the Los Angeles thing. And then, but theater's always been my first love, so I came back and, you know, did The Lion King playing... Yeah. Mufasa and you know all that sort of wonderful crap, you know. Okay. So um, how has your quarantine been? I am fortunate. I have a, a house up in the Catskills in the Catskill Mountains. Yeah. So I have been able to escape and hunker the down. Motherland. Yes, <laughs> I'm in the city right now because you know I got a little something going on, but yeah, uh, the spending the time up there is great because previously I was only a weekender, you know, I'd never spent more than four days and I've had the place forever. So yeah. it's been up there since March. So it's great. I mean, it ended, I was doing the, uh, the revival of uh, kiss me Kate on Broadway. And then mm -hmm. this did this sort of interesting, wacky version of paradise lost. Oh, the, wow. The guy turned it into a play and I was playing, Angel Gabriel. Yeah. And, That's uh, very cool. So, and right after that, as soon as that ended, we went into lockdown. So I just went upstate. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, it, uh, yeah, you've had a really great uh, Broadway career. I was like going down your Wikipedia and it's just like, it's wild. You've had a really cool, interesting, varied career. Very, yeah, you know, I was just talking to a friend about it. You know, you just go, wow, you can now, I can now look back at all this stuff. And yeah. you, the wild and the wonderful and, you know, and they're, and they're all, each one's so individual. And you have these stories that people just don't believe. I mean, everybody has stories about their careers, but you just don't, you know, you, you think, wow, yeah. I really did those things. If you wrote it in a script, you go, oh, come on, you can't put that in there. You know, it's yeah. not about to believe it happened that way, but they do, you know. Real uh, life is stranger than fiction. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for coming on. This has been oh, this super has been fun. Like, it really has. Thank uh, you so much. It's been such a pleasure to meet you and to hear all these stories. Yeah. And you're sure. so great on the air. You're great in everything. Oh, please. It was my, it really was my pleasure. And uh, good luck with the rest of the. Um, Thank you uh, so much. Thank the, you. The, the, I, 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 I don't want to put words in your mouth, Mel, but all the stories you shared with us, I feel like if there's a lesson for young actors out there, and I'll extend it, young artists out there, I feel like. The, the words of wisdom you have passed along to us today are, sometimes you have to uh, hit the fuck softer. <laughs> <laughs> let's, get that, let's get that trending. You know. Sometimes you have to hit the fuck softer. <laughs> that's right. There you when go. you know, you know when it's right to go soft you know. on that fuck. That's right. You really do. Yeah. Amen on that. Amen. So Amen. Thank you, Mel. Right. Come back well, anytime. Well, Okay, thank you. We'll see ya. Bye bye. See, this this is a Zen Watto lesson. This is a right. Zen Watto lesson. Amp Watto hits every fuck as hard as you, he can. You, I've always really said like, that, Watto. You hit those fucks so hard. I'm a hard fucker, but Zen Watto sometimes. Zen Watto. Well, that's soft. a soft fuck. Drinking yeah. my energy drink. Well. Uh, we missed a call from Angelo Bottolamenti. Uh, what? We the uh, uh, <laughs> the. He called. Um, <laughs> so, but we're going to be zen about it. Okay. Um, maybe he'll come back. So now, are, is the George Lucas talk show officially playing phone tag with Angelo? Bobby we are playing phone tag with Angelo. It may not be convenient for him at this point now. Uh, okay. So we'll we'll just see. We'll just we'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll hope for the best. I told him he can call back. Uh, yeah. I've also emailed him, so he knows that. Uh, and. Yeah, we'll just see what happens. Um, are we ready for episode? Uh, we are. He, he, I have a confession to make. Yes, yeah. well. Neither of the files for episode 30 worked for me, so I did not watch it. Either. No, neither of them worked for me either. Did no, anyone no, 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 in the comments if you were able to watch episode three? I'm really sorry. I, I'm curious. 
if you were able to watch episode three, type three, and if you weren't, type X. But on Daily Motion, it says the video is still processing. Yeah, Patrick, um, Patrick, it, you are you are, you are behaving very much like uh, the executives at ABC did by not not airing all of the episodes of On the Air. In a way, it's very fitting. I'm you're really a company. Sorry. You're a company man, Patrick. Yeah. I've always said it about you. You're a company I, man. I, I want to say this because the Google Drag link was not working for me either. <laughs> Many of the people who watched three are saying that they downloaded it last night. So it seems like only if you were prepared. Yeah. Uh, well, guys, not, let's move on. Even Zen Watto isn't at the head of the curve. We're moving on. We're on episode four. Patrick's trying really hard. Okay. There is no, there is no, uh, uh, yeah, you, Patrick, you might want to hit the fuck a little harder. Um, <laughs> you might want to start eating the harder fuck. Um, I, I do want, I do think that, uh, fortunately, I want to assure people there is no continuity. The most continuity, I think, would have been between the pilot and episode two. Um, you should clarify. I mean, there is continuity within episodes. Like, it's not like someone's wearing a hat one shot and then it disappears. And I, then it would comes say, back. I would actually say there is not always continuity, but it's, it's deliberate. It's deliberate. It's a choice. Sure. Yeah. It's a choice. Guys. We're going to start episode four. Let me bring in a guest because we have a oh. cool guest. We got a real cool, cool guest. Yeah, all I love cool guests. All the guests that we've seen so far have been in front of the camera, right? right. Makes but me wonder what? what's going on behind the camera. Watto, mm. did you know there's other people behind the camera? Like another Watto behind the camera? What do no. you mean? Other Who else would be behind the camera? There's people who are working behind the scenes. But this, uh, our guest, it was a, a an art director on the show. Let me bring in Gregory Van Horn. Hey, Gregory! <laughs> How are you guys? Good. How are you? Hello, Gregory. Very sad. Very I've listen, sad. I've been listening in. I feel like I've been like my own little green room here. Now. Good. A digital, a virtual green room. Yes. <laughs> exactly. It's about all the all we could afford on the on our on uh, on the air at the time. Probably that is what we've heard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we heard right. we heard there were no bathrooms. That was the there were no bathrooms. Yeah, um, there were no offices. We worked. We worked in a glorified closet, really. Uh, the designer and me, and he. It was Okaweed, and he smoked like a chimney. The guy smoked. Yeah. All the time. So you know, I probably have a few years of lung damage in me. <laughs> well, let's start. Let's start episode four, and then we can, okay. get, we can get into it. Uh, we'll all press play. Hopefully, this one works. This one does work. I tested. I had plenty of time oh, no. during episode three. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> all right. Here we all go. Right. We're gonna press play in one, two, three. Um, so Gregory, how did you get involved in the show? So I had done a movie with, uh, this guy, Oka Wida, who I was talking about, um, called mm -hmm. Double Impact, starring mm -hmm. Jean-Claude Van Damme. He plays twins, so it's twice the amount of mediocre acting, I have to say. <laughs> so I met Oka Wida. I thought this guy was going to be Japanese. Uh, I got into this room. It's really, it's... It, it was actually like a movie. He was like backlit, smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And he's this really gruff boy. So he's like, ah, can you draw? Can you draw? I was like, yeah, yeah, I can draw. I'm a, you know, I studied architecture. And he's like, okay, fine. Let me just look at my portfolio. He's like, okay, you're fine. You're hired. And I was out. And I was like, I don't even know what this guy really looks like. I get to the studio. We were shooting up in like Lancaster or somewhere. Mm -hmm. Creek. And uh, I get there and I like sort of meet him for the first time. He's, he's from Texas. He's like a Southern... <laughs> is actually his name was Oka Vita. He was Polish, but he wasn't really Polish because he was adopted, and his okay. his parents his, he was actually half French because his his uh, his father was a GI during World War II and fell in love with a French Resistance woman. So get that. So that was uh, yeah. yeah. So he has had quite a story. So yeah. So Okawita was the uh, art director on Twin Peaks. So, uh, and then he got promoted to designer um, for On the Air. So we, uh, so I, I went with him onto this next show, you know, onto, and that was my second show in Hollywood. So it was kind of crazy. I was like, I'm working. And just like the other guests, like I was watching Twin Peaks, you know, from day one, like that was the show to watch. That was appointment television. You know, right. I don't remember what night that was, but you know, we all crowded our, around our little television, and you know, I believe it started on Thursdays. It was on Thursday. It had a very good time slot at first, and then yeah. uh, eventually they shuttled it off to Saturdays, just like on the air. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. That's. Uh, I mean, that's a good way to get in. Yeah. No, it was great. 
yeah, and then my career just went downhill from there on in. So, <laughs> well, it's hard to find if you start off with Twin Peaks and on the air. It's hard to find a third show that is on that same wavelength. It's a, you're you're already traveling a very unusual path. The only thing that came close to that is a show called Lucky Louie, which mm -hmm. was on HBO. Right. The now somewhat <coughs> disgraced Louis C.K., wonderful guy. But we did it all. That show we did all as live, um, live in front of a studio audience, but nothing pre-taped at all. Right. So that uh, when we revealed something, like one time Louis fell asleep and his whole, his whole house got graffiti, we actually blacked out for a minute and then took away a bunch of flats and revealed all the, so it was pretty cool. It was That's great. Cool. Yeah. yeah. But nothing really compared to the amount of time we spent doing all these gags with the special effects department was insane. Like we yeah. just, and, and that, like you no money, like they would like, you know, and love David. David would like sketch something like just really quick. He's like, I want this thing. And it's like in this weird little thing. And then we would be have to like decipher the, you know, decipher his drawing and make it happen within a few days, usually. So it was correct. I mean, it all, I don't know if this is actually the way you did it or if you just pulled it off so well that it seemed like it, but it seems like the way they would have done the gags and the, you know, physical comedy and, you know, set stuff. It seems like the way they would have done it in the 40s and 50s. That I don't know if that's yeah. really how you did it or if it's just like, well, you, you, you know, pulled it off successfully. No, it was all, it was all, you know, it was all sort of in that genre. Like we would, you know, yeah. it was very, it was a very theatrical stage too. Like it yeah. had all this rigging and, you know, and we, we rigged everything up. Things were going flying everywhere. Everything you see was, you know, it was all on carts rolling in and out all the time. It was, you yeah. know, it was all choreographed and, um, and all the, all the art is original. That's all Okawea. He's a great art. He's a great artist too. So he would, he would draw all that stuff, paint it all out. Sometimes he would go down to set and actually paint it. So yeah. uh, it was crazy, but everything was, you know, I think one of your guests was talking about, you know, the cameras were authentic. I mean, they, everything we got was kind of authentic from the time, like all the props, all the dressing and stuff. So that's very cool. Yeah. Uh, we're looking right now at, uh, uh, uh Blinky's, uh, what he sees. Right. It's just, it's very funny to watch. It's a show that's ahead of its time and it really feels a lot like, um, I feel like 30 Rock and Larry Sanders, a lot of those behind the scenes shows owe a lot to this show, whether they know it or not. Uh, yeah, just yeah. Thematically. Yeah. And I don't think anyone who really had talked about, you know, in terms of this sort of show within a show from the fifties, you know, that yeah. feel and the whole, the whole vibe down to everything we were doing, you know, like at the opening, there's the, um, there's a skyscraper with the radio antenna on top. We actually built that at like quarters, like one tenth scale or something. It was it was oh, pretty, wow. and and we and and we it was not a it was not a graphic that came you know that they we actually built all that stuff. So wow. tenth, yeah, so a lot of stuff that you would might think was you know done as a graphic wasn't really. We just you know because he wanted everything to be sort of of the time. Yeah, uh, it's great. So. You um you also you've worked with a, lot, a couple of friends of the show. You worked with Kevin Smith a lot. Yes, uh huh. I did. Yeah, I worked with him on uh, Jay, and Bob, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. Um, yeah. Another wonderful office that I had, which was basically a little section of a very cold sound stage at CBS Radford, where and it was like when it rained, the entire floor flooded. <laughs> and so <laughs> I had great offices back in the day. And, <laughs> Yeah, and I and I worked with him on Jersey Girl, which was really yeah great for the reshoots. It was great. Yeah, he's he's and, very funny. Yeah, he he uh, came on a few months ago, and I think uh, I know Watto would be excited uh, to hear anything about Watto. Do you know what I'm going to ask? You're muted. You're muted, Watto. Watto, you're muted. Watto's muted. <laughs> I muted myself because my sandwich was toasted and loud. Nice Gregory. I believe Patrick is talking about your work with the filmmaker Walter. Ah. What was it like to <laughs> ride on the Wild Hogs? Wild Hogs. Yeah. That was a that was a lot of fun. That was that was like like a paid vacation for me. We spent <laughs> wow. five months in I well, I felt like a tour. We were spent five months in uh, living I lived in Santa Fe, eighth grade every day. And we just we did, you know, we took over this tiny town called Madrid. That's where the festival was at the end, you know, and most of the stuff was shot there. And yeah. uh, 
Malt was great. I mean, it's a funny movie. It is um, a funny movie. There's a lot of funny stuff. I mean, I, I'm more of a dog's hog than a hog's dog myself. But it, <laughs> I'm you I'm know, it's tomato, dog. tomato. We all agree that the filmmaker, Walt Becker, and his oeuvre is top notch. We love well, I have a, you know, if you have time, I got a funny anecdote from that. We Let's have time. Yeah. Oh, you got so much time, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so we were, so um, as you know, in the, in the, if you've seen it, if you're aficionado, you've, yes. the, we blow up the biker bar, mm -hmm. so, um, which was a big deal because we actually, we built that from scratch, obviously, and everything in it had to be sort of, when it got blown up, we couldn't have like metal in it or anything like that. So we had to take every, you know, everything out and we put in some extra balsa and stuff. And then, um, and I'm you have to get the hogs out of there. And we had to have, yes. And, um. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> they're metal. The hogs are metal. What I I did logical. <laughs> so I was good. For, I was good friends with the effects guy, and um, and he. So you know, and all the guys were kind of you know they were all they're all trying to out macho each other a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, like I don't, when one guy like if Travolta got a little something special on his bike, mm -hmm. and Tim mm -hmm. Allen added something special, and they mm -hmm. were. And it was very, you know, it was sort of a little bit wanting up. And um, and I'm now I'm forgetting, I'm blanking on uh, uh, the villain in the show, but. Um, Ray Liotta. Ray Liotta. Ray Liotta. Ray Liotta. Ray. The Ray, Ray was. Very, Everybody loves Ray. And Ray was very <laughs> method. So when they're having these arguments in the bar, when he comes over and like messes with them, he was messing with them through the entire, you know, entire shooting. Like yeah. he, he just was in character the whole time telling them they were real terrible actors and things like that. Wow. <laughs> so when Ray's in front of the bar and, and they're like, you know, they, they're safety distance apart, the safety distance. And they, so they were like, okay, one, two, three, we're gonna blow it up. The guy, the expect that, you know, hits it, he goes, boom. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah. And then he's like, watch this, boom. And the entire thing, and they just, Everyone ran. They were all scared to like it. Just blew up. The second blow was a real thing. They, the, the shock wave was like hit you in the face. It was, oh my it was gosh, <laughs> that's insane. Those were the days. I don't know if you could get away with that now. But. Yeah, you wouldn't need to. You just do it digitally. You wouldn't. You yeah. know, uh, it would be hard to justify. You'd have to really push to justify uh, the practical. I think at this point, because yeah. people would say, "Well, why don't we just press these three buttons and we'll make it happen." Yeah, but that's, I mean, that's the Wild West of, uh, yeah. you know, the mid-2000s when the hogs were truly wild. You're right, man. Um, <laughs> the, other, the other funny thing we did, well, that was not funny. It was funny in, in retrospect. But so we, so this little town is called Madrid. It's in New Mexico. It's where we did the thing. It's unincorporated. It's really off the grid. Um, you know, you can almost homestead there, squat, whatever you want to do. So <laughs> we get in this town and we, you know, um, they're like, we need to build like a giant sunshade because, you know, it's too bright for the, you know, for our actors like coming down the street. So we build this giant sunshade. We, we, we dig all these um, telephone poles into the ground so we can make it look like, you know, realistic. And we think, you know, we, we, we get the, we get the dig alert out there. We get everything worked, you know, and the second, you know, the second day we start digging, we hit the water main and it, the whole, the whole like downtown's flooding and they are they're everyone's desperate they're trying to get a hold of there's like one guy in charge of the water management there he, he knows how to turn the water off he won't come out of his house he was scared to death that he like he screwed up and he i don't think i don't they had to call somebody in from albuquerque to take care of it. so the whole town we like, had to dry it out i think we had like a we were Delayed like three or four days because the whole town was like just it was insane. I googled Madrid, New Mexico, and what came up was Madrid, New Mexico is a recovered ghost town that now exists as an art destination. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, we and left. I, yeah. I also I love fast. where is Wild Hogs Madrid? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Hogs Dogs are, are right in there, second place oh, yeah. in the searches. Let's yeah. bump that no, up. No, no. Dog. Wait, yeah. The Hogs Dogs. Uh, Gregory, I have another question for yeah. you, if you don't mind. Uh, you work in production design, art, art direction. Uh, in your field, you tend to jump back and forth between the two titles, as many do. Uh, they're kissing cousins. But uh, uh, Jack Fisk, legendary production designer, yeah. uh, two-time Academy Awards winner, uh, directed one episode of On the Air? I think two. 
Yeah, I think it was two. I, uh, two, two. Yeah. But uh, is is not primarily a director. As as a young production designer at the beginning of your career, yeah. what was it like working with him as a director? Did you uh, sort of? Yeah. I mean, seek him for any advice? He was, you know, he was uh, amazing. I mean, they were all amazing, obviously. Um, but to have him, and you know, doing he was very, and it was it was good for the for the reason that he was a designer because the show is obviously very heavily visual. I mean, the whole yeah, thing, yeah. almost, you know, every scene, every little bit, you know, so yeah. he got it and he he really worked with it. You know, he really, I think, brought in some interesting ideas and really made it play. And, you know, even in terms of the shots and, and I'm just looking now, just everything was always, I'm looking like there's, of course, we've got signs everywhere, you know, yeah. Right? Yeah. the whole bit. So, no, he was it, great. It's a very handmade, it's a very tactile show, you know, yeah. like uh, whenever there's a digital effect, it usually, you know, it, it calls attention to itself in a way like the uh, Bozeman simplex shots or things like that. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, it fe you can feel how real everything is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, we, and remember, we also did this, all this, um, all this art before computers. So we were hand, you know, we were hand, I was hand drawing all the, the ZBC logo and everything. Did you make the Lester Guy show logo? Uh I think Okawita did that one. I did the ZBC. Right. I did one. Of, I did the game. Uh, the game the show book. one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We kind of split. It just depended on how how busy we were. Yeah. Who, who would have been? Who would have? Tell me a little bit. We're jumping ahead a little. I'm jumping ahead a little bit just because I want to ask about it. The design of the Mr. Peanuts puppet. Who would uh, have? Who would have been in charge of that? I think that that was. I want to feel that that was like a specialty prop thing that we did. Mm -hmm. uh, right. I think that that. And I think that that was subbed out. I. I'd have to look at it. I I I, mean, I haven't gotten that far in the episodes. So, right. Yeah. But um, I you know, wonder like, where, right I now, wonder where that Mr. Peanuts yeah. puppet is now. You know, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably in David's collection of weird stuff. Were you uh Were you ever around Snaps the dog on set? Yeah. Oh yes. What was yeah. Snaps like? To Snaps was actually with? fine. They were uh, there was a few times where it would just you know just wander off, but it, you sure. know mostly. And he was a good sport because I think that he, I think that they, you know, when they're pulling on his, with his leash under the, under the, mm -hmm. under the stage, that's really happening. They're not, there's right. no, so he was, he was a good sport. I don't remember it being, you know. Snap has to do a lot of, you know, he'll walk on screen carrying a sign. He'll come on wearing a little hat and a pipe. You know, there's, there's yes. various things that Snaps okay. really gets into the action. There's Mr. There's, Peanuts. I do not know. I, that would definitely have been the prop guy. Yeah. I don't know where yeah. that from probably some's weird somebody's weird twisted imagination though <laughs> mr peanut has some big uh, uh baby froggy energy which is making me realize we have not seen baby froggy in two weeks <laughs> well I, baby froggy should be uh, on on his way to you Wado, i believe in the postal system Gregory, don't worry about any of this. We can deal with this later. I, I, maybe I want a baby froggy too. I don't know. How, do you have, yeah. Uh, how rude of you, Patrick, to say that Gregory doesn't need to worry about this. Let's include Gregory. I, I for one, do not think we should be blocking Gregory from getting a baby froggy. <laughs> George, do you have. I consider Gregory a friend, unlike you, Patrick, yeah, trying Patrick, to obstruct Gregory's joy. Gregory, I would love to send you three baby froggies if I could. Okay, well, that'd be great. I could use them, you know, that'd be nice. We may, <laughs> may have to <laughs> get someone to make new ones. Patrick, Patrick. I don't want to cause any animosity between Patrick and Wado. I'm sorry. That was no, no, Patrick that's, can make, that's the, been Patrick can make the fight him. by making a baby froggy to send to Gregory now, since yeah. uh, I, I'm sure you, he's ingenuitive. He can figure out a way to make a baby froggy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's no Gregory Van Horn, but he can whip up a little something. <laughs> I was gonna say, and then Gregory can see the difference between uh, our our levels of uh, talent, and I send him the frog. Uh, speaking of which, though, have you do you keep stuff from sets? I do sometimes. Um, I did a uh, we did uh, Frost Nixon and um, mm -hmm. with Ron, my so buddy Ron. We did. Uh, I was as an art director, and I I uh, did the upstairs of a you know seven forty seven period, and I did this cool mural. Uh, uh, of London because we, they were flying to London and uh, and I kept a big part of it. It's actually hanging in my my son's room now. So wow. I, yeah, so I do that. You know, if there's something really special, I used to have a whole collection, but you know, after a while, you're like, yeah. It's, yeah, it's too much stuff. stuff. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and I have things like I use. You know, back in the day, we drew by hand, so I have old blueprints. Um, 
No, those are pretty. I have, those are in LA somewhere. I'm in Chicago right now doing a show. Mm. But, um, uh, yeah. So, you know, whatever you can say, because, you know, and I was like, oh, I'm, I'll always draw by hand. I'm just going to, you know, so I threw yeah. a lot of stuff, but, and then stuff, stuff became property, of course, of the, it's usually property of the, of the show. So, sure. But we know, we know something. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. We, we totally get, you know, you know. Oh, yeah. Gregory, uh, uh, we were talking about uh, wild hogs, but this episode has some wild geese in it. You have a lot of live animals wandering around this set. Yeah. As someone uh, responsible for building that set and dressing it, do you get more nervous working with animals than you do with humans? Because you're like, these things might just shit on my hard work. Yeah. I mean, Travolta <laughs> is probably going to shit in a toilet, but a goose might you shit on know. my set. Yeah. 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 No, I, uh, this one wasn't too bad. That, that, the bin that they come out of, as I recall, was a part of a nightmare to do because, uh. you know, and frankly, you know, again, it probably wouldn't be allowed today with a bunch of ducks just sort of stuck up in there. But, uh, <laughs> you know, and I don't know, and I can't remember if, and I was wondering if, though, if they were pooping down on the ground at that point or not. I, I, I mean, wait a second. I feel like George has gotten a phone call. He's muted. I know, but I want to, I want to let him. If he wants to talk, he can talk, but I I feel like... Okay. All right. Uh, hey, everybody. Hi, Gregory and Patrick and Wano. Uh, let me just make sure that you can hear. Uh, Angelo, are you there? I'm here. Right, you can hear that? Yeah. Angelo. I hear you. Okay, great. Um, so, Angelo, uh, just uh, it's so great to have you uh, on the show. And uh, if you wanted to just talk a little bit about how you started uh, working with David Lynch. Sure. I can tell you about uh, that. Um, <clears throat> well, one day uh, I was at home and I got I got a call from my friend uh, Peter Runfalo. Uh, he was a music producer and his friend uh, Freddie Caruso was a line producer for Dino De Laurentiis. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time uh, they were working on a movie titled uh, Blue Velvet. Right. And that uh, film starred uh, Dennis Hopper and Isabella Rossellini. And David was the director of Blue Velvet. Anyway, uh, Isabella uh, needed to sing the uh, Bobby Vinton song, Blue Velvet. You know that song, right? Right, yeah, for, classic. For a crucial uh, scene in the film. And so they were shooting down uh, in uh, North Carolina, and I went down to meet with Isabella, and when I got there, uh, Isabella and I went into a little room, and I, and a, together with a piano, and I worked with Isabella for about two to three hours straight until we got a good take on a, a cassette recorder. And so when we finished that, uh, Isabella, I, and Freddie Caruso walked over to the set uh, where uh, David was shooting the very last scene. And uh, we had the cassette tape. And uh, uh, Freddie said, to Angelo and Isabella did this, David. Why don't you take a listen to it? And David put his earphones, and right, he, and right away he said, that's the ticket. It's peachy keen. And I said to Freddie, Fred, you know, I'm from Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, you know. I never heard an expression like, that's the ticket, and that's peachy keen. What does that mean? He says, Angela, David loves it. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, David, uh, Isabella, and I uh, uh, went to New York to record the song. And David heard it, and he absolutely loved it. Now, in the film, uh, David wanted uh, to use the cocktail twins for music, you know, some music in the film, but it was going to cost a lot of money. Uh, and um, but David had full uh, uh, creative control, and the producers were in a conundrum because they didn't have the budget. I think it was like fifty thousand dollars to pay for the cocktail twins. So Dino De Laurentiis uh, asked me you know, to write a song, you know, to replace the song that David loved so much. So I said, you know what, uh, ask David to write a lyric. 
and uh, and then I'll try to write some music and hopefully uh, it, it would work. And sure enough, uh, you know, David wrote these beautiful lyrics on a scrap of paper, and I wrote I, think I wrote music to it, and the title was uh, you know, Mysteries of Love, Mystery of Love, and uh, and then you know I wrote it, I played the song for David, and and then he said, Angel, go and find a singer, you know, who has a, a unique voice like someone who could sing like an angel. And uh, a friend of mine was really cool. And I said, let's go to the studio and record the song that David wrote a little bit too. And I wrote music. And I said, and, but you got to whisper the song too. Really. But she, you know, she said, make it like that David said, and her sing, you know, like a song that floats, you know, and, um, he heard, he heard what Joey did, and he flipped out, and then, uh, David uh, asked me to start a film, and then, like that, you know, David and I got together, and we wrote a bunch of new songs with Joey, and, um, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little info on uh, how Twin Peaks all started. show of the television titled Twin Peaks. Before he shot any of the scenes, David would come over uh, uh, and, and we would work together and he would talk through the scenes. And as he talked through the scenes, I'd close my eyes at the keyboard and I would like music. I would just play and record. And as, as he talked, he would go through these details. And his words, this is what's remarkable, his words simply would get me on, on a track, and we would take the space. And every project that David and I have done, and you know, has been like that, he would just talk to me, sitting next to me at a keyboard, I'd close my eyes, sit down at the keyboard, and play. Just amazing how that worked out. And as far as the music of Twin Peaks, it had a lot of ground. Because uh, there's so many different kinds of moods, you know, together with the widest range of relationships and emotions. There was sadness and passion, ecstasy, you know, love, tenderness and even a little bit of violence. So, yes. and David said to me, Angelo, he added, he said, he's gonna need music that's mysterious, you know, dark and, and abstract, and there's gonna be scenes that will need some jazzy, cool stuff, you know, sometimes dissonant, dissonant and sometimes sexy, you know, for instance, the character, as we all know it, Sexy Audrey, and Sexy. after all of these requests, request uh, David. I remember him telling me he finalized it by saying, "Angelo, the most important thing is I'm going to need music that's going to tear the hearts out of people." <laughs> okay, so I started uh, composing, and then I'd have David's descriptive words his various moods and those words in my mind as I kept writing this stuff. And then, you know, I'll just let you know that you know, David and I have been friends. Actually, we're more than friends. We're more than just friends. You know, we're brothers. And That's so nice. I'd like to wrap this up for you guys, you know, by sharing a, a favorite a Twin Peaks uh, anecdote with you. And, yes, please. And that's this. I had a call from Paul McCartney that um, Paul would love to me to uh, come to London and go to the Abbey Road Studios and work with him on something that uh, he's working on. And, um, 
and, and would, I, would I be able to do that? Anyway, so, so I went to London. I met with a Paul, and um, I, I had, did some writing for him and uh, with an orchestra, and he came over to me as the conductor stand and said, Angelo, I, I just got to tell you this. He said, I was invited by the uh, Queen's, uh, uh, by the Queen's office that um, to, to perform 30 minutes of my music to help celebrate her birthday at Buckingham Palace. And Paul said to me, he said, now I'm just about to go on stage, and the Queen comes over to me, and she says, oh, Oh, Mr. McCartney, it was just so lovely to see you tonight. And Paul said, oh, your highness, I'm so thrilled to be able to come here, help celebrate your birthday, and perform 30 minutes of my music uh, for you. She says, oh, Mr. McCartney, I can't stay. And she took her finger and pointed to her watch, and she said, don't you see, Mr. McCartney, that it's five minutes of eight. I must go upstairs and watch Twin Peaks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was it, man. Oh, so, uh, I can, I can leave, I can leave you guys, you know, oh. you know, with that. Angela, and, that's, um, that's beautiful. You know, I just also want, want to stay, say, you know, David and I have been friends and actually David and I are more than just friends. We're brothers. Yes. And, um, so, ah. Uh. Well, thank you so much, Angelo. Everyone's very excited to hear from you. Well, thank you, Angelo. Be safe, this everybody, and, and we'll talk soon. All right. Bye, Angelo. Thank, thank you. Bye, Bye, Angelo. Thank you. Talk soon, Angelo. <laughs> we'll talk to him soon. We're going to talk to him soon. We're going to talk to him soon. I owe him a phone call. Here, let's 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 start this episode really quick, and we'll talk to Gregory a little bit more because I feel like we ate up a lot of his time. Sorry, but um, technically that was a, a time-sensitive moment. Amazing. Truly the best. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to be upstage <laughs> by Angelo. <laughs> when Angelo's on the horn, Gregory will take a moment on the desk. He understands. Yeah. He is yeah. great. We had to put him in the van because we had Angelo on the horn. <laughs> yes, we put Gregory in the van. Uh, uh, all right, right, let's yeah, press play. Right. We're going to press play on episode five. One, two, three. Um, All right. How's my sound? Because I had to adjust it to try to get the the phone to. Is my now sound okay? he's good. Yeah. Now, now it sounds. It's, now it sounds good. It's good. It's all um, good. We're very zen. I'm sorry I got angry at you about Froggy Gate, Patrick. But Watto is very zen. I get it. Gregory, what what do you remember being the hardest thing about this show? Um, the money. I mean, they had the money to do to the work. I mean, because you know we were trying to do. You know, we were trying to reinvent this whole environment, this whole world that, in, you know, right. it was in between, the, you know, doing the control booth and the giant stage. But, and that was all, you know, at that time, that was all, you know, stainless steel laminate that was expensive. I mean, just doing all those yeah. lights and everything. And then, and then, you know, there were, there's five, there's eight gags or 10 gags per show that you're, you know, that you've got to get done. Um, and, you know, shoestring, the shoestring construction group, you know, people like we're building on, you know, we have to, we have to uh, construct between the bells uh, because, you know, there's just no room to do anything. So yeah. um, there is a kind of punk rock, a punk rock sort of DIY vibe to the show's aesthetic. And I guess that was out of necessity as much as anything, but I th it's, it's hard to imagine that this would have been improved in a way by having unlimited resources because part of the charm of it is it does feel like uh, a show that you're getting away with, you know? There's yeah. That... yeah. Unlimited resources. The thing was, is that like your Palpatine joke. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking, you know, cause I, you know, the whole dispute with ABC and I, I think ABC was expecting another Twin Peaks, you know, and they were right. for all as much money as they, and when they didn't get that, they were like, forget it, you know, and uh, sure. but he still wanted, you know, he was still wanted to do it, which is great. I mean, it was, you know, again, it was a lot of fun to work on. Now, I, yeah. David, David directed the pilot and we had talked to some of the actors who said that once uh, once it was uh, picking up the back six, shall we say, of the of the season, that David was not around during that. But did you work with David in the design? Aspect? He, you know, a few times. We he, he was he was in 
he wasn't on stage, but we did meet him like in a trailer, you know, he would, and then he would scroll, you know, if he had something specific he wanted to do, we, mm -hmm. right. know, we some information, but it was mostly, yeah, I mean, we were, especially at the, you know, we were all excited during the pilot because he was around, you know, he was doing it. And then we were like, right. this is going to be great. And then he wasn't, you know, he was, he was angry. I understand why. And so it was sort of, it became a little bit though, it became a little bit of a, a show that didn't really have a captain. So, the, the, so there was a lot of, there was a lot of infighting a little bit, yeah. you know, sure. is, you know, design and whatever, you know, what we needed to. So, um, but yeah. when the, I think what one of the funniest things sort of or, that was not on camera was, you know, because David likes to cast all kinds of different types of people in, in various different sizes. So we would go, there used to be, you know, and there's, I think there's still, there was a commissary and everyone would go and eat lunch there. We wouldn't, we wouldn't get catered lunch. We just, you know, you buy your own lunch. So the whole, it was the whole cast and crew. So, so you had like Ian Buchanan and, uh, and uh, the, the other woman, they, uh, the yeah, Nancy and, yeah. Um, they're, they're, cheap. they're big, they're, they're tall, very tall and a little bit. And then you had, you know, the smaller people. And so it was just this odd mix of people that were all, not to mention not to mention some of the people that were in the crew which were also really a bunch of characters so what were what were the uh the hurry up twins did you meet the hurry up twins yeah they were they they were two different people <laughs> <laughs> yes i believe they're i believe they're brothers i think they're i don't you know i don't remember yeah was, but... yeah um uh, shoot, I had a question. Now no, I, don't I have, I, there aren't too many things to collect from on the air, but I, and I, there's a part of me that wonders whether this is pirated. Oh, George, I almost, I almost bought something like that. What do you mean bought? I've had this for decades. Uh, and this is a, this is a script, uh, from the Lester Guy show, September, dated September 1957. Uh huh. Uh, I can't imagine that this is pirated because I feel like, no. uh, you know, I can tell you how to, if you look, you know, if you can look closely at the logo and if it mm -hmm. looks a little like it was hand drawn, then it's yeah. not. Started. If it's. Oh. A, yeah, no, that's, that's, I did Is that. that. The real thing? <laughs> wow. yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, because it's all, it's back in the day when you inked, I inked the whole thing. So. Um, wow. yeah. Slap a blue check mark on that right, baby, right, George. Right. You just got the day. Right. I put the, so. Uh, yeah, you you that's nice. 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 Yeah. yeah. The um, uh, put this in my museum. Um <laughs> the I I really I really do feel like when you look at this show, I mean part of the thing when this was airing on Saturday nights on ABC, yeah, this doesn't look like any other TV show, then or now. It, yeah. I, I, it's hard to find uh even shows that are period shows similarly. Yeah. Do not have the same aesthetic as this show. It really is one of a kind, which is funny for a show that is a throwback to another era because a lot of times we have a template of what we see. You know, Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, which was on around, roughly around the same time, uh, was also a period uh, uh, program, but doesn't obviously uh, a bigger budget. We had bathrooms uh, wherever we went. We had bathrooms. I never, we never had that problem. That's mm -hmm. such a unique problem. To Where did you go to the bathroom when you were? Like I think there was a cup under the desk, and we just you know after right. Was, you never like snuck into like the Seinfeld bathrooms. No, we weren't allowed. We were like we were considered. We were not Seinfeld quality. I'm sorry. Couldn't, they, could not, they could not. They could not spare a square we, for you. We were just uh, we were we were one step up. up I think that we were. They shot a lot of soaps there. And we were just one step above up above the soap operas there. Oh, you were like, barely prime time. You they were considered just above daytime. Well, but, I mean, you you say one step above this soap opera. Susan Lucci isn't shitting in mugs, right? I don't <laughs> understand. <laughs> maybe we were below. Maybe we were below them. I, you know, I mean, I don't. I'm not trying to be like oh, uh, no. snarky here, but it feels like yeah, no toilets. It's pretty low down on the boat. The the it actually feels. Well, to hear the 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 way that you were treated, it almost feels like it would be impossible for a major network, maybe a streaming service could get away with it, but for a major network to treat a show like that now. No, yeah, yeah it, was, it was, yeah, it was kind of, and I, you know, I was, I would, this was, you know, I was young, it was my second show. I didn't really know, you know, I mean, I, I knew it was normal. I thought it was like, well, I, I, was, I was like, I got to pay my dues, you know, and yeah. I, was like, you know, welcome to Hollywood, pee in the right. cup. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and yeah, it's 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 yeah. 
the stuff that we were doing in terms of like a lot of this would have been handled by effects. You know, they would have they would have taken. We were building a lot of this stuff just in the shop and just hoping hoping yeah. it would work. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. but I do think I do think that in a in a in a strange way, uh, all of the things that were liabilities or disadvantages at the time. Uh, in, in a strange way, helped helped it uh, hold up. Like it's built. This is a solid show that's built to last mm -hmm. if people can find it. Right. That's the. Oh, big... I love there that there was that transition just then with uh, that uh, Leslie Leslie Glatter did where uh, it goes from the the passing of the handkerchief and then it cuts to another. It's there were yeah. things people were doing on the show that that were more stylish. Yeah. Just more stylish generally. Yeah, and it was again. It wasn't something. This wasn't what was great about it. It wasn't Twin Peaks. You know. Um, and the, you know, again, it's shot, it's not shot like that. You know, it's a wholly different type of show and it's, it's, it's yeah. great to see it. Like, you know, and I guess in a, way, you know, in a way, if they wanted a Twin Peaks, what they got was something that was as different from Twin Peaks as Twin Peaks was from everything else, where it was kind of like, it was, it was Twin Peaks to Twin Peaks. It was a, another right angle. Perfect, yeah. That's a perfect way to think about it. Yeah. But um, and I was just thinking the, one of the previous episodes where uh, Betty's in the, the giant kitchen and we just have one counter against the wall and a window. Yeah. And that was on purpose. We didn't, you know, it, it was a combination. We, you know, we could have built more if we wanted to. But in that case, they, they're just like, that was, I think that, and that was a David vision. He just was like, I just want really simple. I want a honeymooners even more simple than a honeymooner situation. So, uh, but yeah. Yeah, you guys yeah. never really, you got, did you just have the one, Soundstage, because you never really leave this area. No, we really. have one soundstage, um, and that yeah, we, that's why you know, and we there's were building a restaurant. There's a restaurant set in the second episode. Oh, yeah, that's true. yeah, yeah. Uh, but not much. That's about and, it. And there's also, I love, uh, and this must this must have been a fun challenge. There's so many times where you cut to the audience at home watching, mm -hmm. and it's and right. very even up to the seventh episode, we're seeing new environments being built. Oh, yeah. uh, there's a man in prison in the seventh that we don't see until episode seven who's watching the show yeah. from prison in the full black and white stripe uh old-fashioned prison outfit yeah um but it's so it's so fun to see uh you'll you'll see it for it's all of five seconds maybe less on screen mm -hmm. and you see the whole uh, uh world that is built and then it's quickly yeah those kind of cutaways were not uh were not conventional in 92 now uh now animation does it a lot you'll sort of have a show where you'll cut to a thing and then cut back because right. you had to build a whole world for that shot that was just a, a couple seconds on screen right. and yeah. that was the thing it was like are we gonna really do this you know are we and we did it we're like you know and there were a lot of there were few, you know there were a few cheats we do a lot you know there were a lot of times where just like if you luckily you know it was lit well like it was just lit vignetted down so you didn't see the you know half the stuff that was just mm -hmm. which you would have been totally taking you out of the situation yeah. So, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the cinematography and the lighting was a major, just a godsend in a lot of ways too. And it, it really makes it more of a, you know, a theater piece in a lot of ways than just, you yeah. know, just like a yeah. television show. So. Uh, I see those red curtains in the background. Uh, uh, it's one of the few, it's one of the few uh, slight crossovers with the Twin Peaks look that you see. I'm looking at the back and seeing those red curtains that have become so iconically associated with uh, Lynch, that so he loves the mother show. Oh, Lynch, yes, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. And I think, uh, and I'm wondering in Twin Peaks, I'm trying to remember because, uh, when we so we were shooting, um, we were shooting, uh, I can't remember if we were shooting the pilot, I think we were shooting the pilot right when Twin Peaks was wrapping up, and um. I, Okawi and I went over with, because they said, well, you can take anything, you know, you don't have any money, but you can take anything from the Twin Peaks set you want. You know, we can tag it and they'll bring it, you know, we'll get it. And I think those, I think those curtains are from the Twin Peaks show. Those curtains are oh. from the Black Lodge. Yeah. Wow. That's, I think that might be an exclusive. That's I don't a know. Suit. It could be an exclusive. I've we never heard that before when I've, yeah. when I've. I want. I want people to add that to the IMDb trivia for the show. <laughs> I hope I'm right. I, you know what? Print the legend. Print the yeah. legend. No, I, mean, I honestly do because I do. I remember us going, being like, we, we we took, you know, we're like, we can use that bar. We can, you know, we can use, but there wasn't so much. It was pretty stylized. As we know. Yeah. Right. Right. Let's, let's no. say this, George. Let's say this. This is what yeah. we want the IMDb trivia to say. On the George Lucas talk show, Lucas Lynch, 
Uh, art director Gregory Van Horn believes that the red curtains also came from Twin Peaks. There you go. Yeah. Tag us in there. Make sure people see it. So whenever they're checking uh, the on the air IMDb trivia page, they'll see it. Yeah. Um, what What's been your favorite thing that you worked on? Like your overall best memories overall, T to B, top to bottom. Favorite? Well, I would say the most. I mean, I think the most uh, rewarding show was doing Frost Nixon. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Ron Howard was pretty amazing. It was a pretty amazing. I mean, that that the cast, the crew. I mean, everyone was super professional and, and you know, and we just amazing actors. Like Frank Langella is like it's just it was you know crazy. You know, yeah. again, but the funny thing again, there's a, but that'll I'll tell you about that, which was he was doing. So Ron was doing Frost Nixon, which was going to be the we were hoping was going to be a you know big award winner. Um, sure. Shut out a little bit, but. Um, but at the same time, he was doing uh, the sequel to uh, the Da Vinci Code, which I mean, the demons. Yeah. So they, so he brought in. So while he's doing, so he's doing the pre, what they call the previs on the Angels mm -hmm. and Angels, all the pre-production, like all the stuff, and he's got this whole art. Like we're in this crappy sound stages in Culver City. That seems to be a theme for me. Crappy <laughs> sound stages, <laughs> and. And we are getting, you know, we got a, you know, we got a little craft service going, but nothing much. And we're like, it's a walk up, you know, we're walking up. It's just a big bullpen office. Um, so we go to raid like their, to raid the, um, to raid the, the kitchen of the of the previous crew, and they've got they got a full spread. They got all these computers out. They're like, you know, rec room. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? Yeah. And we were building like we built all these sets on again two small sound stages. But built you know everything had to be crammed in. Yeah. You know? So, but it was worth it. I mean, it was a great. You know, and everyone had to work. Everyone had to work for scale <laughs> because they. Had, so, I mean, it was union scale, but it was kind of funny. It was like again, these guys next door are like making all this money. And it's like but, I, I'm curious, Gregory, uh, on the set of Frost Nixon, were people placing bets? Oh, on what? On what? Who would win, Frost versus Nixon, or was was that sort of banned as sort of insider trading? I'm just, I would wonder if you're in the mix of things, if you're kind of duking out. I yeah, got four. I mean, I I think maybe right. for, for the method, especially the method actors on there, they were they didn't yeah. actually read, they didn't read to the end, so they were still, right. they don't quite know what was going on. And they that shot two different endings, right, to prevent spoilers, <laughs> so that no one knew who was. Right. Well, they had, yeah, they had an ending where, where Nixon goes, you know, he actually gets to be elected to a third term and the whole. Yeah. 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 He just cold cocks Frost. He's like, <laughs> eat my fist. Yeah. I did look up uh, Frost Nixon budget. What do you think it was? I'm going to say that it was 20 million. Okay. And I'm going to say $2. <laughs> Price George? is right. I'm trying to George? go without George? Dollars. George? Uh, four, four, four dollars. <laughs> uh, okay, then now let's do this. Angels and demons. What do we think the angels and demons budget was? Eighty-five million. Two, two fifty. Uh, sixty-five. Uh, angels and demons, one hundred and fifty million. Wow, so that's a, that's a little bit. Next in, twenty-five million. Oh, well, yeah. it's the answer. There you go. Did, yeah. Was there ever a part of you since you started off on you started off working for Lynch Frost? When you got to Frost Nixon, did you feel like th there was some th that it was like the circle was complete? Yeah, the circle was complete at that point. <laughs> was there ever a part of you that wishes that you had worked on the film Jack Frost? Mm. So you could have a trilogy of experiences. Yeah, like, yeah. I need another Frost in my yeah. My you need that th you're looking for that third Frost. Like maybe yeah. uh, Frosty the Snowman sequel. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. yeah, let's get it trending. Yeah. yeah, put it out. This is you putting it out into the world. And right. it, yeah. it, well, it, I, have, I have to have and Cynthia Nixon has to be in it, so I have the whole. <laughs> Cynthia yeah. Nixon is Frosty the Snowman. Let's get the fan <laughs> art happening. That would be quite a poster if it was Nixon. Yeah. Frost, is Nixon. Frost. Frost Nixon. Yeah. All you have to do is you have to convince her. Well, I think I always see the way you have Nixon Frost on the poster looks good, but if you could get yeah. her, just let her name be below the title on the poster. Just so you can get yeah. that Frost Nixon magic, right? You you flip the standard. You have all the supporting cast above the title, and then right. she's the one name below the title. Well, yeah, that's, you know, 
sometimes you have to do it for the art. Just that. Greg, what, can you tell me a little bit about the art that you're uh, in front of right now? Uh, the, the art that's on the wall behind. This, this is uh, so my wife loves to go to estate sales, and so we're, and we're in the suburbs of of uh, of um, Chicago. So there are a lot. Well, well pre-COVID, obviously. So we would we basically you know we're sort of dumpster divers. So we go and we you know we go and we find mid-century stuff all the time, and. Uh, you know, we just collect it. We have a whole crazy collection of stuff like that. Yeah. So it's art. And we had, we usually, we really, we're very happy when we can, when we can, uh, when we can beat out the hipsters that come and try to find the mid-century stuff. Usually that, yeah. that we get there early and, you know, if we have to trip them on the way in out the door so we can scramble and get that nice uh, piece of uh, rug art, then that's what we do. You know. <laughs> Cause you're where, are, are you guys shooting right now? Cause you're on yeah. Chicago PD, right? Correct. Yeah, we are shooting. We're on our, uh, I think we're on our fifth, sixth, fifth episode right now. Um, the other two shows had to shut down because of the coronavirus, but we yeah. now, knock on wood, we're we're going along. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been very interesting. Um, it's shooting is a entirely different thing now. We yeah. drive, we all drive to every location to look at it. We don't take a bus. Um, we get are you, able, are you able to say whether or not? Because I guess every show is having to make choices as to whether when they come back whether their show exists in a world where COVID exists or whether people can go alternate timeline, they can go prequel, they can go sequel, they can, you know, they can, there are directions you can go. Right. I don't know if you're, if you're able to reveal that, whether Chicago PD is going to be an R. I, I, I mean, I, within a, yeah, it's, um, it's a little bit of a, a mixed bag. Um, we have a lot of, um, we recognize that we'll do a, if we have a sort of a crowd scene, we'll, a lot of people will be wearing masks, but of course, Actors wearing masks is not is not ideal, obviously. In that Except device. you can rewrite the dialogue later. <laughs> exactly. It makes ADR, it suddenly becomes yeah. a dream. I guess some way like, you can shoot a lot less footage, you know? That's true. And they do, you, yeah. you don't even actually have to hire the actors that you had on the show. You could just bring in a new guy, people that just sort of look like them, and it doesn't matter. Yeah, and it, you don't even need to roll the camera. You can just get still images and then yeah, just yeah. shake them a little bit. <laughs> and dub yeah. in the voices late. Is that how they're doing it? Is Chicago PD, have you come back to just shaking the images? Yeah, we shake the image. And I don't even just, you know. That's a scoop. That's a scoop. I That's have a scoop. A, right behind them, I have, I'm holding another picture of a set. And I just, we don't really have this. Wow, set. that's yeah. great. Because that, you didn't even need to do that. That's fantastic. That's <laughs> take a lot of that's, money away. The, the tough amazing. part is getting the shaking rhythms right. Because the actor shaking photo has to be like this. And then. You know, you want to start shaking on the other side with the background. Right. Well, we, you know, if you did an earthquake scene, then you could really get yeah. it or something like that. What we're right. learning here is you're really committed to your work. And that's yeah. really yeah. nice to hear. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Whatever it Whatever takes. It takes. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, what are your, because uh, this episode's wrapping up, what are your closing thoughts, closing memories on On the Air? Well, I would say that... Uh, what I do, what I remember mostly is just the camaraderie. I mean, everyone was really in it together. I mean, there was, you know, you were, and it was, it was a small group of people. So you're just, it, it felt like theater. And I, I had a theater company in LA for years. And w this reminded me a lot of it that, you know, you were just, you know, you were in it. Everyone was friendly. It was, there was no, there were no real boundaries between actors and, and the crew because yeah. it's so interlocked. Even, and usually art department, we're not, heavily involved on the day-to-day -day operations on stage, but I was mm -hmm. constantly there just trying to, you know, put out fires and help the director in, in, in whatever way I could while Louis was out designing stuff. So it was, you know, and we were, then we were two, it was just a two man crew for us. So yes. we just, we had to, and we had the construction guys and that was it. So, wow. but it, it was really rewarding. It was great. It was great. I mean, you know, I, you know, to say to live work on a David Lynch show is like, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the best. Good calling card. Oh. Uh, did you design these doors that closed? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nine dollars. Oh, that's the best. That, that whole gear thing too. Yeah. No, that yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. very cool. Yeah. Um, when you have to design something like that, because at one point, at one point it rips off a person's dress. Yeah. Did you have to design? Is that is that a, a trick of, uh, is that just a, uh, you're just pulling it or did you have to design a, a, a gear yeah. that did that? Yeah, then we had designed it, and then I think an effects guy came and helped us with you know how to get that all to work together. Uh, mm -hmm. 
but yeah, no, a lot of this stuff all had to be really had to be worked out. I, you know, it's been years now, and I could it'd be hard to even tell you how we came up with half the stuff. Yeah, right. But yeah, everything was yeah. I luckily I was young at the time. I don't know if I could do that now. It was so much time. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> energy. Oh, I see your name. Craig Van Horn right there. Yeah. It's spelled with an E, though. That's really the funny part. Oh, that's funny. I got it right. The first episode, one of the first episodes, there was an E on there, and I complained. I'm like, that's not my name. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, and then it just said puppet provided by a puppet factory. I didn't see the name, but it went by really fast. Oh, yeah. Uh, so there's your answer. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been super fun. Greg, it's been so nice meeting you and talking about this. Thank you for coming and sharing your stories with us. Thank you, George. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Watto. It's been great. Super fun. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck shooting. You too. Bye. I feel like I know I know we want to keep this train moving, but we've been dreaming for a couple. We're gonna cool for a second right We're now. Cool. Okay, because I just I just want to say I know we've been going for a couple hours now, but it should be noted. I feel like uh, a major news story that we have not yet addressed. Yeah, I know a lot of people were concerned that last night they heard a booming laugh rip across the night skies, and of course that laugh came from our own producer Patrick Kotner a sign that the legendary figure of the film world has died. Yeah. I got a text David about Proud. from Watto. Watto texted me asking uh, if that I was said, my why, laugh. Why yeah. are you laughing so hard? I'm worried. And yeah. of course, the news was that David Prowse, of course, a stable in the George Lucas play, has passed yeah. away at the age of 85. Yeah. He was my Mr. Peanuts in that <laughs> yes. I, he was a puppet that I had someone do the voice yeah. of, and I had him... Uh, Goodbye, Peanuts. Yeah, and um, then you said goodbye after a while, and you didn't like talking to Mr. Peanuts anymore. Yeah. Um, uh, but, George, you... But that laughter, that laughter was also disguised. If you didn't hear Patrick's mm-hmm. laughter, no. it may have been because it blended in with the millions of voices that could be heard laughing last night when Star Wars Detours, the episode that was leaked was finally viewable by the people that was the problem. the show. That was right. Uh, you, you heard so many sort of normal people laughing normal people at great laughing comedy. Funny, silly comedy. And then right? it almost drowned out the, the laughter of one sick man, a Joker-esque figure, who laughs at what makes the rest of us cry. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'll it, say yeah. that. If, if people want to watch this one episode of Detours, it's online. It's on. I we saw it on Reddit. I'm not going to tell you how to get there, but it's there. Uh, it's definitively can. not leaked by us. I, just, I feel by, like I need to say that you. as many times as possible. We would not love. Know. We, we would love. Aside from the legal ramifications, yeah. we would love to take credit. For instance, if we found out that it, we in any way inspired this, we'll we, take credit. That would nothing would make us happy. And I'll, I'll also no. say this: people on Reddit thought it was us. That's right. Yeah. There were comments in the cold. Star Wars leaks subreddit asking if it was yeah. us. Those trolls I, I assure you, if we leak something, you'll know. You'll know, you'll know that we did it. We will not yeah, be passing we'll, the ball. Yeah. yeah. We'll be crowing like there's yeah. no tomorrow. Yeah. All of that having been said, please follow the mystery Twitter account with links to all episodes of On the Air. It's it's one segment from one episode that's out there, but it gives you, I think, a good feeling for what the show is. Uh, talk about a little taste. Talk about a little taste. So that, a little taste. I saw someone say online, I'm surprised this is only six minutes long. I thought it was a 22-minute show because it's been framed as a full episode. Not the case. Each no. episode is made up of sort of three stories of that length. Yeah, what you were seeing is act one of three in yes. an episode. And then you, then you multiply that by 39 and then right. many more scripts that were never completed. Right. Detour's well, episodes are each comprised of three standalone acts, each centered around a different location. What? Well, we're getting funny. a good question in the chat, and I'm going to bring it up, and you're not going to like it. What is it? Here's here's the, the scoop, okay? The Watto drawings are going to be Life Day deliveries. Yes. But life I'm going... Day- I'm going should we I'm say we get fan art of a character uh, that I've just created called Darth Mail, and uh, M I A L, yes. and he's the reason why uh, Watto's uh, uh, drawings haven't been sent out. He's preventing. But Watto. here's the scoop. I don't want to spill the tea, but here's yeah. the scoop. Okay. I apologize for the delay. 
the Life scoop day. is yeah. The scoop is that each drawing will now be coming with a complimentary contact ship. That's the scoop. Watto is giving you a little something extra to apologize for the delay, much like a Kickstarter that delivers its product two years after the promised date. And let's you know say I want to talk about something that I have here while we're talking about things. Okay, uh, George, let me just bring up. Yeah. Can I announce uh, our December marathon? Yes. yes. December 20th, the George Lucas Talk Show holiday special. Raising money for Feeding America. Look at me. Look at me. Guys, look at me. I got a lot of gifts that I want to give out. Wait, gifts? G-I-F-S? G-I-F. T S George. He added the T. I got a lot. G L T S G I F. G L T S G I F T S. You're talking yeah. about. Yes. So what we're gonna do for the holiday specials? If you donate a certain amount to Feeding America, we're gonna figure this out later. Enough so it makes it worth it to mail it all out and everything. Like you know, covers all the price. You will get a gift from me. Is it a and surprise from mystery gift? And from Watto. It's Is a it multitude of gifts that we're going to talk about during the show because it's. Wow. I've had boxes in my kitchen uh, from friend of the show Mike and Tally. I have boxes of some of my own stuff. I have a lot of stuff that we're giving out. Uh, well, let's say it's going to it's going to be a slightly different show. It's going to be our holiday special, and so yeah. we're going to have a lot of drop-ins, a lot of guests, a lot of performances, but not to watch a lot. I want to. I just because I'm excited that I realized that this is right here in my uh, in my area here. That uh, I have uh, some bonus kisses from Patrick. That's true. You what, what's the story on these, Patrick? Why do I have six kisses uh, that weren't sent out? Uh, I just I kissed a few extra ones just in case we needed them for something. But some well, of these are very specific. There's one for Nick and one for Jane. Oh, it's Patrick. Because, what? Well, it's because what? It's because uh, originally when uh, we were going to send these these pictures out to people, I forgot to kiss some of them, and we were going to send it along with it, but then I ended up kissing the ones that need to be kissed. Okay, um, Patrick, I'm going to suggest I got, What am I supposed to do with these six kisses? Well, George, I'm about to tell you. I came up with a great idea. Zen right. Watto just got in tune with the universe and was given yeah. a great idea. Patrick, bring up the donation spreadsheet. Bring up the board. Let's see. The, let's check the board. This is this is where we were when I checked a few minutes ago. Maybe oh, I gotta eat my feelings. Okay. I gotta. I gotta. Right. I gotta eat my so feelings. George, yeah. George needs to eat his feelings. But this is what I want to say. We haven't been talking donations a lot. This episode's kind of been long form interviews. This has been our very Zen NPR watchathon, right? Yeah. Let's make a donation stretch goal. If you donate over a certain amount, the first six people to do so get sent a Patrick kiss. Okay. Um, Let, let's decide what that number is. And let's say that the ones for Jane and Nick are at a slightly higher premium. Yeah. And listen, if you're Jane or Nick, now's your time to get in there. You get a double kiss. Uh, we yeah, are currently at, we're currently at 1591.65 is where we were at. Um, okay. But let's, let's come up with how much should the kiss cost? A kiss from Patty and the Nick. I don't know. Do you want to say the next six people to donate $50? I think it should be a hundred. Okay, the next six people to donate a hundred dollars, fresh hundred dollars, to either you know you choose either either place. Uh, email the George Lucas Talk Show at gmail .com and you'll get a little kiss from Patrick. Maybe I'll find something else to send to. So there's six. There are six in total, including the Nick and the Jane. Yeah, yeah. So um, if you want the Nick or a Jane, maybe donate one hundred dollars in one cent. Yes. I want to say we are holding off a second because we do have a guest coming who's having a little bit of tech issues, but we're going to find out. I may have to, we may have to do an uh, Angelo and give him a call. We'll find out. Oh. Um, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, hopefully we'll know in a second. Um, and if, if it takes a few more minutes, we might just start and then keep going from there. And just and wait to, I've heard those hundos to come rolling in. People want to feed America. Listen, so for to do it. I'm saying for $100, I better get dinner included with the kiss. Next time you're in New York City, only release detours and the pandemic is done, we will get dinner. How about this? Patrick, what about this? What about if they donate $100? Yeah. Will you send them a kiss? 
and also send them a, a food delivery. Like they'll, you'll send Grubhub to their house. Sure, sure. But it's it's up to me what you get. Yes. Yeah. Deal. 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 Okay. So the, whoever that was, if you if you donate a hundred dollars, Patrick will send you a little. <laughs> he'll send you dinner and a kiss. Yes. That is that. Uh, I like this mug, this new mug, but you see it, it works well with the schnoz. It does work well with the schnoz. Uh, I'm able to get the drink under there. George, what are you up to, George? He's going to eat his feelings. Oh, okay. Oh, yes, I forgot. Um, I forgot about that. I'm going to eat my Garmambosia. My Garmon Bosia. My Garmon Bosia. I'm going to eat my Garmon Bosia. George, let's press play on episode six while you eat your Garmin Bozy, okay? All right. And we're going to... The return through. of the Jedi. Yeah. All right. Let's press play. I will say these episodes, if you're paying attention, they are lining up quite nicely with the plots of uh, the episodes of Star Wars. It's true. Mm. All right. Here we go. We're going to press play in one, two, three. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if our guests can get the tech working, we'll bring them in. If not, I might... Have to call. We'll see how it goes. All right. Um, Patrick, can you? Is there sugar in cream corn? Yeah, Patrick, yeah. please look yeah. it up. He's famously diabetic. George, uh, I don't know. I'm gonna pull off screen for a second. Hang on. You gonna look this up? Glad Patrick I mean, about it, my health. Talk. Talk about producing. You ask him to do something for the show, and he instead decides to leave the show. Can someone actually? Can someone in the comments tell me is uh, is it okay for me to be eating this garmon? Someone bowl? please yeah. look it up because our producer has decided to pioneer a radical form of anti-producing. Rather than cater to the needs one. of the production, he chooses to uh, disengage. Oh, and you know what he's doing right now, folks, don't you? I, I mean. I got two guesses. I got Zero two guesses. Question. Zero question in my mind what he is doing right now. Yeah, he's the not. Only question, the only question I have is how many wings? <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. The full 40 or is he going for 80? Yeah. Got to know. Got to know. Got to know. And and does he? Hey, George. Mato, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I have a guest on the phone. Um, do you want to meet them? Absolutely. Yeah, I'd love nothing more. Okay. Uh, remember how we had uh, Greg on earlier and he was a guy from behind the camera? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have another person coming on behind the camera. Isn't that exciting? Weird way to introduce someone, but sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm going with how the day's been going. Uh, this is the co-executive producer of On The Air. Please welcome Robert Engels. Robert. Robert. Hi, folks. Can you guys Thanks. hear Robert, guys? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. Uh, so Robert, we're on episode six right now of On the Air. Uh, we'd right. love to hear your uh, your your origin story for the show. Well, you know the um, I think uh, that episode is is there is a trick called the Gypsy Traveler, mm. and and that's uh, um, I have a, a magician friend who showed me what that was, and and I thought, well, this is a natural for Lester. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is a, this is a great place for him to screw up, you know. <laughs> which was which was really the inspiration there, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, yeah, and it's it's the you know at that point when we're doing the the sixth one, uh, we already know we're only going to get seven. Do you sure. Know what I mean? um, sure. It just uh, um, um, it was just a weird time, you know. The uh, ABC owed us. Um, another series mm -hmm. and um, 
uh, you know, so the response to the series with our fans was terrific. Yeah. But uh, um, uh, a lot of other folks uh, <laughs> weren't, weren't so kind. <laughs> I mean, oh, something God. we've been saying all day is it feels very ahead of its time and shows like 30 Rock or, you know, uh, Larry Sanders owe a lot to this show. Uh, oh, completely. Yeah. Completely. If you talk to, uh, uh, if, if you were to talk to writers for Larry Sanders, they've all seen yeah. the series. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, uh, um, and the same with 30 Rock. They were on that, that uh, um, same thing. I mean, it was just, uh, um, we, we were just way ahead. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. and, uh, and at that point, um, it was also that, that um, I think we were, I think David and I were doing another movie together, something mm-hmm. like that. So it was pretty crazy. So David was in, for, well, actually, for the last two episodes, three episodes, uh, Mark Frost was making a movie in, like, Texas. Yeah. And David was in, like, um, uh, um, I don't know, uh, like, Greenland or something. <laughs> it was just crazy. And um, so for the last three or four episodes, it was just me. And uh, on one, on, you know, uh, in one sense, it was really fun. Yeah. Uh, in other sense, I was the, you know, I was the, I was who everybody called. <laughs> and I think at some point, ABC was happier that they could talk to me yeah. as opposed to those two guys. Because you know I mean? <laughs> that was, well, it was just kind of a weird um, juxtaposition. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, of, for sure. Of, uh, um, uh, you know, of how series in those days worked. And, uh, um, yeah, it was just, a, for me personally, it was a really crazy time because those guys were gone. And, uh, um, I, you know, I could call them in that, but most of the time the calls were, were to me. Sure, you know I mean? sure. And, uh, uh, and, and that was, uh, you know, good career-wise, that was great. But it was, it was pretty crazy because it was a David Lynch and Frost show yeah <laughs> you know I mean? yeah yeah it, 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 i mean i was running it you know because i was there but it was their show i mean i don't mm-hmm. mean to, i was so lucky to be there I and mean, i don't mean to be negative at all about that no. that was just terrific but uh um and that was such a fun cast and uh um uh you know, we most of those people in that cast had been on Twin Peaks, mm-hmm. and we were in the same studio, mm-hmm. so it was uh, a lot of it was just uh, 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 really easy, very, very, very much family. You, know I mean? you might, uh, you might know the answer to this. We had Greg Van Horn on earlier, who was the uh, art director for the show, right? And he said that the red curtains in the on the air studio uh, they grabbed from the Twin Peaks studios when the show was shutting down. Do you know about this? Yes, yeah. We just we just used the the same curtains. Amazing, yeah. amazing. He's exactly right. I mean, we, you know, we were at that studio, uh, you know, for the years of Twin Peaks, and and then we did on the air there. So there's there's lots of <laughs> there's even well the 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 red curtains are the most obvious. Yeah. But yeah, we used we used lots of props, lots of things from the show. Do you know what I mean? It yeah, of like course. We were, they were there and that was our you know it was their studio i mean i was there running it but it was uh, we, we um, also heard the the budget was very tight so it makes sense that you guys would try to reuse as much as you could completely yeah the budget was um uh, yeah it was just a um um like, like you said i i don't i can't quite remember i was looking at my notes the other day about this i, I, I can't quite remember I, I just think that abc was thinking this isn't going to work at all mm-hmm. that we own this show, you know? And, uh, um, uh, so a lot, a lot of it was just, you know, it was, there wasn't much overtime. There wasn't much, any of that stuff that yeah. you usually can get with the show. You can, you know, you get a couple of days where you can go late. I don't, I don't, we did, we did not have that luxury. Do you know what I mean? Of um, course. And, uh, um, uh, and so it was like trying to, get each day done i mean it was a it was a blast but it was like uh, um you know the case of like david lander who was was terrific yeah you know he'd, he'd say anything he wanted to say <laughs> he was improvising yeah <laughs> that's like, like, do you think there was yeah. more there was more improvising on this show than there would have been on another lynch uh, frost production oh completely yeah completely yeah i mean we were just trying to make our days do you know what i mean and, yeah and, uh, um, uh, yeah, so that that was um, 
yeah, that was, that was a part of it. It was like you said, it was, um, it, it, it felt so uh, goofy and wonderful. And, and yet we had to stay, stay on budget. And, and uh, 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 I, I can't, I can't remember. I, I think, I think when ABC saw the first two episodes, they loved it. So mm-hmm. it was just this weird, weird thing. And then I, like you were saying, uh, you're being kind of a, being ahead of its time, but it certainly wasn't like anything else in television yeah, yeah. definitely hi robert this, this is george um i i wanted to, to just chime in with this because i do feel like if you think about these a lot of the single camera uh no laugh track comedies of that era most of them would get labeled as dramedies they had that word they invented right. for for things that they they'd sort of shuffle a little bit more towards and there was no way to do that with this this was so clearly a comedy from head to toe uh, and I think that's one way that the timing on this show is more fitting with 21st century Adult Swim than with ABC Primetime in 1992. Yeah, oh, no question about it. I mean, it's 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 uh, um, uh, you know, if you show it to someone now, they get it completely. It looks mm-hmm. like it looks like it's current. Yeah, I mean, whereas in those days with no laugh track, with no, you know, it was a single camera. It was uh, um, um, you, you, none of the none of those. Uh, uh, like I said, uh, you know, Cheers. I guess would would have been. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, but Cheers was filmed in front of a live studio audience. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas, it uh, just it just it was somehow that show more than maybe any other multicam looked like a single. They somehow managed to make it feel like a single cam show, while still having that audience uh, dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're, 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 that's truly exceptional. Yeah, it does. I noticed that the other day. Uh, uh, it looks like a single camera, but you realize, no, they're they're moving around. Yeah. You know what I mean? yeah. Yeah. Now, episode six and seven, um, it, you know, as crazy as the show starts in the pilot, like it's already starting at a very, uh, uh, it's very madcap right out of the gate. And yet mm-hmm. six and seven, which never aired on ABC, I believe. Um, I don't think so. Don't are think so. Are are still doing things that are. Tr- you can watch, I think, the first five episodes and there's surprises through them, and still be, I think, shocked by some of the things that you try in six and seven. From the the magic tricks at the end, which are full on for all of the the sort of tactile aesthetic, full on sort of digital effects at the end, uh, which is not something yeah. that most sitcoms of the day. They did not have special effects. Uh, and then yeah. in episode seven, the, the woman with no name, it really is um, because that one was writ- written by you and, and David. Yes. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it, yeah. Yeah. and it truly is unlike any episode of any sitcom I can think of. And if, and to think that it's from the same writing team that wrote Firewalk with me, they couldn't be more different. You couldn't have two more different uh, writing examples than those two uh, scripts, I think. Oh, Did, completely. Yeah. I what mean, were, what were the conversations cool. like when you realized that those episodes weren't going to be uh, seen on ABC? Do you remember? Well, you know, it was just, it was not a surprise. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, uh, my guess is, like, I, I, I can't remember, but my guess is that, that probably ABC changed uh, whoever was in charge of development. Sure. Um, um, so that, that, that always kills it too. Do you know what sure, I mean? Sure. Um, but but all those you know even the woman with no name, those are <laughs> those, that, that, that's all David stuff. You know I mean? <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. That it, sounds right. You know, we, yeah, it doesn't. It sounds like it sounds like a person in Twin Peaks. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah, right. Um, um, but we wrote those episodes um, uh, um, at David's house. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. We I I drive up there and we'd we'd uh, um, go through it and then I'd go home. And uh, uh, you know, basically type it up and, and we do stuff, and then we meet the next day. But then at some point, like so, when we're actually in production, uh, both of them all were gone. Um, but I certainly knew how to do that. I mean, it was like you know, it was it, it was such a part of me. I, I I got that completely. And Ian Buchanan was so great. Oh. They, you know what I mean? It was a great cast of really, uh, 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 really nice guys and yeah. gals. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it yeah. Really Do you know what I mean? Um, um, it, 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 uh, uh, um, it, it was sort of the feeling of, of, 
for the cast and also the directors, it's like I, I can't believe we're getting away with this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Episode seven is also um, uh, in in pretty rare company in terms of it being something in, that David Lynch is a writer on, but not directing the episode himself. You know that didn't happen very often. Usually, if he was. Uh, uh, even on Twin Peaks, most of the episodes where he had a writing credit, a lot of times it was the episodes he was also directing. Exactly. Exactly. Did that feel like? Did, that, did you feel the pressure of running the show, knowing that uh, uh, you had written this episode with him, that he wasn't going to be around for the actual filming? Oh, of sure. It? Oh, sure. And the same with Mark. I mean, we were the three of us were great friends. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? It was. Uh, um, um, I mean, it close on showbiz, but it was so. Um, uh, uh, you know, family, for lack of a better word. I don't mean to, you know, that's people always in showbiz discussions talk about family, but it really did feel that way, you know, because it was not only were the was the writing by the same people that did, you know, Twin Peaks, but the the actors were the same. Yeah. The, do you know what I mean? It, yeah. It, uh, um, um, you know, it, it was like an extension. It was sort of like a. a I've never thought about this, but it, it, it's kind of like a, a, a comedy version of Twin Peaks, mm. mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like if, like if, if on the air was on a local television station in Twin Peaks, that, that it would, would make sense. Right. Yeah. yeah I, I, part of me would like to imagine that Invitation to Love aired on ZBC. <laughs> I don't know whether it was ever confirmed what network Invitation to Love uh, aired on, but in, in hindsight, I'd like to retrofit that into the, into the uh, mythology. It, yeah, yeah. And as I recall, the the you know, the ABC thought we were making fun of their soap operas. We said, "No, it's just don't, don't worry about it. We're not making fun of anybody. Yeah. Don't just stop paying attention. Don't worry about it. It's okay." <laughs> yeah. Well, and they didn't. They just took it off. Yeah, you know? yeah. Nobody ever saw the last team, so it. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, it was uh, like I said. It, it was like an extension. You know, we were in the same studio, the same people, yeah. the same. You know, everybody was the same. Now we're doing a funny thing, as opposed to a. Well, Twin Peaks could be pretty funny too. Yeah, at yeah. Time. But, but uh, uh, it just was uh, like you were saying before. It, it just felt we were way ahead. Do you know what I mean? It's For sure. just yeah. like we thought it was funny, but um, uh, you know, you could show it to. Uh, you know, even now, I, I would suspect that uh, studio execs wouldn't get it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? mm-hmm. uh, you know, yeah, uh, I, w- I was saying uh, earlier, it feels like if you're a network executive, it's hard to figure out what the notes would be for this show because you have to understand it, what's happening at a level that I think would be, uh, I, I think it'd be hard. I would have feel pity for an executive who had to come up with like one or two notes. You know what I mean? Yes, yeah, and, and and ones that are helpful as opposed to their, you know, uh, um, you what know. Was the, what was a network that, note that you remember getting for this show? Um, what the hell is going on? That was <laughs> really common. Yeah. Know, where, where are you going with this? Sure. I mean, it was like, well, you know, uh, we're going nowhere with this. That's the whole idea. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's yeah. just, uh, um, um, we're having fun. It, it, yeah, and it was such a such a different time, you know. It, uh, um, I, I think this this is more about Twin Peaks or something. But I remember when we started that, ABC wanted a Bible, right? And right. Uh, um, you, you you can't quote me on this because I'll deny it. But this is what <laughs> happened. <laughs> um, and uh, a woman in Ohio, I think, had seen the pilot. When she was in Los Angeles, the Twin Peaks, and she sent me about uh, thirty pages on what she thought should happen in Twin Peaks. Oh wow! She was just obsessed with it. Sure. So then the network asked for a Bible. Uh, David and Mark weren't going to do a Bible. That fell on me, and I just took what she wrote to me and put my name on it and sent it to ABC, and. That was great. They said, thank you so much. <laughs> was like, That's I, I never read it. I don't think ABC oh ever read it. They just <laughs> wanted a document to say, we have a Bible. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, wow. So, so that was, but that was that, uh, like I said, I don't mean to dump on ABC. They served me great for me. So I don't want to do anything about that. But that was that era of, 
of, um, you know, a show has to have a Bible. Mm-hmm. Then it has to have a schedule. Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? And, yeah. and uh, I yeah. get that. You know, they're responsible financially. But, but um, uh, since, the, you know, I've been on loss for the show since then, it, it uh, um, that, 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 that era is gone. Yeah. You know I mean? Yeah. Uh, they, they just want to know the show works and, and, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 you, and you're, you're on budget or under budget. Mm-hmm. A, a lot of it's that. And, and, uh, and it's so different because this was, you know, uh, had, had there been screening, had there been, uh, you know, a, a showtime mm-hmm. in HBO right. in our eighth year of this or whatever we would be, do you know what I mean? Yeah. In our 20th year. Yeah. Of this, but but th- that wasn't that era. Do you know what I mean? We were just, we were just before that where yeah. the, I guess HBO must have been around, but now you'd have, you know, all oh. these, all these. Well, you guys know better than I do. All those, all these streaming uh, outlets um, that that, of course, we, we would have been a big hit. Of course, it. yeah. It's it's just that the we were from, you know, just before that era. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But, uh, um, where uh, you know, going back to Twin Peaks, we were on. Uh, I think we were on just before 30 something or just after. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you know, but that was it. And we were on ABC. You yeah. Know, right? You were right. You were right before TV changed. Yeah. Like yes, exactly. before things changed for, for well, I had, I had the young Indiana Jones Chronicles on ABC around the same time. And it was, they, it was, I think they were, ABC was very much trying to figure out what, what could work. Yeah. And not yeah. having a lot of luck, yeah. even with something as popular as Indiana Jones, uh, was yeah. not able to find uh, the the rhythm that they were looking for. Yeah, yeah, and, and compare that to now, where, where you know, what is the latest one? I, st- I got contacted by someone from Tubi, T U B I. Yeah, you know, um, um, I, you know, they they're saying let's let's do a series. It's like, sure, I, I have no idea who you are. Yes, yes. But, but welcome you know, to twenty twenty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, uh, but in those days, it was the three networks. Yeah. You know what I, mean? now, um, um, I wanted to ask about Kim McGuire because uh, you had so many Twin Peaks people, and I think people uh, associated Kim McGuire because she was in Cry Baby and Serial Mom as, as sort of a John, more of a John Waters actor than because not as many people have seen uh, her in Twin Peaks. So that's a very she fits right in in the sort of David Lynch world of of uh, performers. Oh, very much so. Very much so. Yeah. I don't. I don't have any real personal memories of it. That no, she was. She was perfect. You know what I mean? Who ha- who has the rights to on the air at this point? Who who owns? Uh, like, if it were to f- looking oh, for a home on, who does? Oh, I think David and Mark do. I mean, I think in terms of like finding a finding a, a release on Blu-ray or getting it onto a streamer, it's not tied up with ABC in any way, is it? No, not at all. Not hmm. at all. I, I, I got um, some uh, a little dipshit residual <laughs> from it, you know. <laughs> so go. And I think it, it was from, uh, uh, I, I think David Marco on it. Uh, I, have, I have a question. What do you yeah. think, uh, what do you think happened to Lester after the show went off the air? What do you think, <laughs> what do you think happened to him later in life? <laughs> that is a good question. <laughs> I've never thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably ended up doing the weather somewhere. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> don't you think? Yeah, that kind of was his personality. That know? sounds right. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. Someone else. Someone in our chat is asking a question uh, that I wanted to bring up. Someone watching the show. There's a comedian named Scott Ackerman uh, who's a friend of the show. He's he's been on. He hosts a podcast called Comedy Bang Bang. But he's told a mm-hmm. story before, and he's never been able to corroborate it. So I feel like this is probably the time to be able to corroborate it. He said that. In the nineties, well, here I'll start with this. Did you ever work at a video store? No. no. Okay. Well, then, never mind. He said that in the nineties, he was talking to a video store employee about Twin Peaks, and the video employee said that he was you. Oh, oh, you know what? I bet that is is that uh, I live in Silver Lake, right? Yeah. And and there was a video store that I. Uh, 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 very close that we always, you know, like we all yeah. did, you know, you had done stuff. And, um, there was a guy that worked there that was obsessed with Twin Peaks. Oh, interesting. And, and I don't know how it came up. I think I was joking, you know, I was renting something else. Yeah. 
And when I asked him, I think I, if I'm remembering it correctly, I asked him, how are the rentals for Twin Peaks going? Yeah. And then he said, why are you asking? And I said, well, because, you know, I wrote half of them. Oh, interesting. And we had to be friends. Um, a guy younger than me, and and that might be him. I mean, I never thought I, twice about. I that. wonder if it like, is. You know, what I mean, uh, like I said, it's called Video Journeys, and it was really popular because it had all these old movies that other video stores did not have. Yeah, turn in, and that's because of whoever owned it was a big movie buff. So they had a whole. Uh, you know, they had their regular stuff, and then they had a uh, another room off to the side, huge room. It was just full of classic movies. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. and the and all the clerks uh, there were movie buffs, as opposed to you know part time job guys. Do you Amazing. Know what I mean? So I, I bet it's I bet it's one of those. Well, people. he's very successful, so I'm sure your friendship meant a lot <laughs> to him back in the day. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty funny. It was the first time ever I felt like a celebrity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. George, do you have any? Um, do you have wait, any last? So, wait. So, were we confirming? Uh, Scott tells a story that it was the video store employee who said he was Robert. I don't know. I don't Is know. Is it possible that Scott was the video store employee, and that he might has be that might be possible. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I don't know. And he has reversed it, and that's a that's a very uh, Lynchian device to, for the, the <laughs> oh, God, uh, yeah. identities yeah. to be swapped, and and uh, and who who am I, and what year is this, and so forth. Yeah, interesting. Oh, I don't know. Exactly. I've, never, I've never heard of that, but it, it certainly has that. You know, there's a uniqueness. to yes. uh, Twin Peaks. That, you know, about once every four months, um, there will be. Uh, uh, there'll be a car sitting out in front of our house, right? Yeah. And um, every once in a while, they'll come up and knock on the door and say, does Mr. Angles live here? <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. And they're usually really nice. I mean, yeah. I've never had a problem with them. Yeah. But it's so weird. That was so long ago. And there are people obsessed with this. But Robert, okay? let's, let's be clear, because we're talking to the public right now. Don't do this. I want to tell people mean? out there not to wait outside your house. No, no, don't do that. Don't, don't do, that. do that. Don't no, do that. No, no. Um, it's just, uh, um, but it's a pretty amazing thing. Well, you guys, I'm sure if you, you know, if you just uh, um, uh, uh, go on the internet, yeah, uh, oh. um, you know, it, it still has this huge following. Of course. That, that um, you know, and, and I get, um, uh, you know, questions from uh, people I have no idea what they're asking <laughs> about about the show. Yeah, like, I don't. You know, I mean, I, you know, it's very flattering and it's great, but um, uh, 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 that was a long time ago. I, I don't. You know. So, Robert, uh, um, but before I let you go, can you really quickly explain Firewalk with me to us? <laughs> Didn't need me. Oh, great, great, great. Thank you. Um, I do, I do, here's here's a great story about Firewalk with me. You know, it opened the uh, Cannes Film Festival. Yeah. Right. So we're riding in a limo, David and I, um, going to the premiere, right? Yeah. And um, I can hear Angelo's music, and I said, "Wow, that's pretty. That's pretty cool." Um, how, how did you? You know, we had, it was like tapes then, right? Mm -hmm. I said, "How? how who, who? Who? Who took care of that?" And David looked at him and he said, "Open your window." <laughs> And I opened my window, and it was playing in the trees oh as we drove to the opening. Wow. <laughs> wow, wow, and wow. I was like, whoa, that's pretty amazing. That is wild. You know I mean? um, uh, yeah, and then to, you know, to, uh, um, you know, we went the day before to, you know, look at it and test the sound and all that stuff. Yeah. And there, there's all those complaints about, how loud it was <laughs> it was the whole idea it was supposed to be really loud that was the idea you know what I mean? so it, it but uh, uh yeah the the whole the whole can thing was was pretty weird and i couldn't get in uh um uh to the premiere was just packed and i left my hotel room too late and there were you know hundreds of people yeah in my way and uh um Two security guards that uh, I, I don't know who they were, who they worked for, they, they grabbed me and just pushed me through the crowd. 
Yeah. You know I mean, two big, huge guys so I could get in there before it started. It was just a, a, a weird experience. Amazing. So, I, mean, I was like, you know, and that, of course, was one of the first movies I've ever written. Yeah. So it was like, I thought, I thought, hey, Shoulders is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and and you, you had that was quite a quite a, a spring and summer because I believe you were booed at Con for Fire Walk with Me, and it was well, they didn't, it wasn't really that's the big story and I don't remember getting booed. Huh? It, it just was kind of a weird response. Sure. I don't any chance is there any chance Bruce Springsteen was there because it could have been they were chanting Bruce. Very possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go with that story. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Add it, to the, uh, add it to the wiki, everyone. Yeah. Robert. Uh, but then shortly after that, on the air, I think premiered like uh, about a month and a half or so after the con experience. So you had this sort of whirlwind summer of of a, a new TV show and a and a new new your first film at, at premiering at con. Certainly to if not booing, certainly a it got a uh, an energetic and emotional response from people. And now, of course, it's widely regarded as one of Lynch's best films and a classic. And um, yeah, yeah, it was it was a weird response. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't uh, um, like I said that, that story is that they booed, and I don't remember that. But um, um, uh, but the, but it was a weird response. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It was like yeah. way too quiet or too you know it was just odd. But uh, um, um, uh, uh, but then it's you know then it's it's the Cannes Film Festival, so that, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? There's yeah. a whole yeah. other a whole other reality going on there. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, of course. very much so. Yes. Um, uh, uh, I mean, it's really fun to be there. It's a blast. Very cool. But it's, uh, yeah. um, you know, um, you know, you're, um, it was my first experience of getting you go to a restaurant. There'd be two movie stars there. Yeah. You know? and, and they come over and say, saw your movie. Pretty good. <laughs> I was like, what, are you talking to me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you see what I mean? So <laughs> funny. Uh, yeah. Robert, thank you so much for coming on. We have to have you come back on a normal week just so we can chat with you some more. Oh, that would be great. Just let me know. Yeah, we love it. Great. Thank you, Robert. So this is going on. Who's, who's listening to this conversation? Lots of people. We've got, uh, we've got like 350 people watching right now and then some more people oh. will be watching later. I will. I will. They're loving it. They're loving it. All, All right. right. We'll talk later. Be, be okay. safe. Bye, Robert. Bye, Robert. This is Wato. All right, guys. So we're going to start this last episode, but I have a guest that I want to bring in for this last one. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah, that's absolutely I fine. Guess I, 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 got, I got George on that one. Yeah. yeah. We're, uh, we're going back to the world of people in front of the camera, guys. Okay. I want to bring on... Wait a second. Wait a second. You can't do this so quickly. I, I just adjusted my worldview to the idea of there being people behind the camera. So now I have to reset yes. back to people. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm right. Zen. Okay. Well, I want to bring on your friend and mine, Lester Guy, Mr. Ian Buchanan. Hi. Ian. How are you? Nice to see you all. Thank you so nice much. Lovely to see you. Hello, Ian. I'm George. Very nice to see you. Yes, I'm Lester. Nice I, th I think we met once before. I think I met you for a project, and then I never saw you again. So I guess I... <laughs> Somebody else yeah. got that, but thank you. It was very nice. You were very, very. Were you? Were, was I considering you for Indiana Jones? Uh, no, it wasn't Indiana Jones. It was something else. But it was around that time, though. Yes. So yeah. but, uh, I, I, I haven't seen you since. So I guess it didn't go. You've been busy entirely yeah. well, but that's all right. That's okay. Uh, well, here, let's start this last episode, guys, and we can we can chat about the show with Ian a little bit. All right. So we are going to press play in one, two, three. Um, so Ian, when did you first hear about on the air? Because Twin Peaks and on the air sort of overlapped a little bit. Yeah. In wise a little bit. Yeah. Yes, they did. Uh, we were, I think, uh, towards maybe the last, uh, second to the last episode of Twin mm -hmm. Peaks. I think David, uh, had approached, uh, Miguel Ferrer and myself and said he had this, uh, little idea for something and, um, would, were we interested? Of course, we were. So that's that's you know we. Uh, I th there was a very sh short gap. I can't remember. It didn't seem to be a great deal of time actually between Twin Peaks ending and uh, David directed the pilot of On the Air. So that was uh, pretty pretty soon afterwards. So uh, yeah, I, I can't remember the time frame. That's all like a 
a blur at this point. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people, uh, they were saying that the show went into production very close to the ending of Twin Peaks and they were reusing, reusing a lot of the sets and props. The red curtains came from the Twin Peaks set uh, in the studio for this show. So they would they would reuse a lot of the Twin Peaks things. Um, so that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Yeah I, th- uh, yeah, I think and also, uh, you know, David's uh, relationship with uh, the network I think was getting woven into uh, the on the air kind of, yeah. you know, uh, network executives sitting behind the velvet rope, but actually being ducks, I think was, uh, um, I kind of, I, I remember all of that sort of unfolding sort of um, as, as, you know, because Twin Peaks was sort of moved around and had been this huge phenomenon and then got shuffled around and, and sort of, uh, I think that uh, David, uh, it appeared as if he resp- his response to that, I think, was woven in through the the network's handling of on yeah. the air, or the you know Zablotnik network's handling of uh, on the air. So that was uh, that was it. Yeah, yeah, and there was a lot of uh, definitely a lot of same crew people, and the prop people were the same. So it wouldn't surprise me. I never really, I no, I don't think I ever recognized anything as being from yeah. Twin Peaks, but then, you know. Yeah. Um, pretty crafty about it. They disguised it well. It doesn't, even the even something as distinctive as the red curtain blends yeah. into the, the world of this very naturally. Yes. Now, I remember when, uh, when, when your character first appeared on Twin Peaks, um, and I don't know how many people remember this, but in the, in certainly in the first season of Twin Peaks, they were actually reporting on Twin Peaks in Soap Opera Digest. They were they were covering it as if it was right. a new soap opera because it was a very and I specifically remember when you were added to the when you were joining the cast. Uh, I first saw of it as a notice in Soap Opera Di- Digest because they were very excited since you had had experience in that world. Right. So to their readership, it was very much like uh, uh, an exciting uh, blending of the two worlds. Yes, uh, I kind of, I was, I was sort of very excited to get away from soap opera <laughs> and go work for David Lynch, but I sort of ended up in another soap opera, especially with our little love triangle, which was, yeah. you know, like, like Lucy, Andy and Dick was very much a soap opera. Um, within, uh, I, I, uh, yeah, it was. I, I think I was the only person that was surprised by that because I really thought I was going to be part of the sort of maybe the gritty kind of wonderful world of uh, Twin Peaks. But uh, no, I ended up doing a, right. uh, uh, back in a soap opera. And the soap opera audience were kind of, it was ABC and I'd always been on ABC. Mm-hmm. So they were kind of, they, they captured quite a bit of that audience also. So that was, although right. I think they were a little surprised because the, character of uh, Dick mm-hmm. was totally unlike the character of Duke who they'd been <laughs> used to but uh, so yeah. but it was you and know from from Duke to Dick for me it was a very sort of it's it just a, a great transition I loved it so, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, probably the closest that Dick Tremaine got to the the darker edge of it was the little Nicky uh, subplot the devil child. Yeah, uh, which I, was still a comedic yes. subplot, but was still entering into the world of evil that that uh, lurks beneath this town. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. This is years uh, before Adam Sandler made Little Nicky. Was going to say he what? Years before Adam Sandler made the film Little Nicky. All oh, right. Okay. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I just saw Papa is picking his fucking who's, awesome. Who's like an adult? He, he actually became an adult, which is something you always think. That's Those good. Kids though. get frozen or like treated like bonsai plants and don't ever grow up. But he's yeah. a, he looks like a he looks like a fully grown adult. So. <laughs> he was uh, fun. We're watching episode seven right now, which is a genuinely wild episode. It's crazy in the best way uh, of on the air. Um, what are what are your fondest memories or not fondest memories of working on the show? What are the things that you think of when you think of on the air? Uh, uh, we, you know, I loved working with Miguel. I loved working with Nancy Ferguson. 
Mm-hmm. Um, David Landers, I just, he was just phenomenal. And uh, Kim was great, was wonderful. We were all, we had a great time. We loved it. We loved, I mean, we had, you know, ro- rotating directors. So it was great, very exciting to have Betty mm-hmm. Thomas or Leslie Linker Gladder or Dish- uh, Caleb Deschanel. Or, I mean, it was great. It was just very, it was very exciting. And uh, we were on the, you know, CBS Radford lot, which was the grown up lot then. You know, we, Roseanne was there, Evening Shade was there. Yeah. Uh, I think Seinfeld was there. So it was the kind of the big, it was the great, you know, the great lot to be on. So we were all very sort of like, you know, we had the smallest trailers on the lot, sure. which was fine. Sure. Everybody else had these huge, you know, double white, two stories. And we all had these little sort of porta potty cabin things, but uh, we were uh, very happy, and it was yeah. a closed set, and uh, which only which meant only like very famous people could come see us, which was great. It was like you know, Rosemary Clooney got to come see us, and uh, cool. like a lot of uh, I don't I don't even, I don't think George Clooney was allowed on set because he was doing Roseanne, but. I don't think he was famous enough at the time, so Good. he didn't Good. get to come on. So keep, you got to keep him he got humble. To stand outside. Yeah, ah. I said you got to keep him humble. <laughs> get out of here, George! <laughs> you can't come on. I haven't uh, seen him since either, so I don't really know. I can't. Yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah, think I believe, he, I believe he's selling coffee now. He's a coffee salesman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I I tried his tequila. I haven't tried his coffee, but uh, yeah, I should uh, probably probably do that. Yeah. Now, prior prior to uh, working on uh, working with David Lynch, uh, you you were on It's Gary Shandling's show. In addition to appearing later on on the Larry Sanders show, you were on uh, quite a long run of It's Gary Shandling's show. So you have a you have a pretty uh, uh, amazing array of groundbreaking TV shows that you were a part of. That they were all sort of game changing. They're shows that people still talk about. Right. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. I. I yeah, I, I loved. Uh, yeah, I loved. Shandling show was definitely. Um, well, it was right next door. The only reason I got to do it was it was in the sound stage next to General Hospital. So, you know, they they wouldn't. They were not going to let me out to go off someplace and do a, another show. So, they only allowed me to run next door for like one hour for the table read and come back and do General Hospital, and then the next day run next door for blocking and come back and do General Hospital. And then, of course, they came to General Hospital for that one episode, and they took over the General Hospital set when yeah. uh, Gary's mother had, uh, it was her favorite show, and then she wanted to go, uh, I can't even, I think it was, it was, it was very bizarre. I hadn't actually seen it. I saw somebody had a clip of it, but uh, um, it was, it was, it was sort of very bizarre for me, like, you know, my, my two worlds colliding, right. and uh it, it was, but uh, it was great fun. It was great fun. Also, you know, with with the Shandling show, we did the Fox version and we did the mm-hmm. cable version mm-hmm. on the same night. And the Fox version had was very tame, a little tamer, and had you know commercial breaks. And the cable version was totally out there with no commercial breaks. So it was kind of we had this great luxury of doing. Um, I heard you say earlier about uh, Twin Peaks. If Twin Peaks had been on cable, it would have been. An entirely different show, so we had that luxury of being kind of restricted by a network, and then the freedom of being on a cable show. So it was, it was, it was very exciting. I loved it. It was a great uh, training for me. I mean, Gary's wonderful. I mean, I had hadn't done a lot of comedy, and certainly hadn't done sitcom. So uh, it was great for me. I loved it. It was great, great time. His Zen Diaries were a big influence on me. Yeah, he's got a great. There's a great documentary that came out a few years ago uh, about Gary. They were they went through. Th- there's a great documentary that Judd Apatow did about oh, Gary. Yes, I saw that. Yeah, I saw yeah, that. It's yeah, it's really good. Yeah. I think. Uh, uh, yeah, I think um, Gary's memorial. I think was actually was actually recorded by was it HBO did the documentary? I think, yeah, yeah. I think was it? Yeah, the yeah. memorial was, but I think the memorial got so wonderfully irreverent and so very sure. gary that i don't think much of it <laughs> i think until more people die i don't think i'm just gonna get to see that. so I, uh, that's probably um, yeah <laughs> was, yeah, yeah so I, someday I, I, I if you the documentary yeah. it was very telling actually i didn't i was very close to gary but i didn't uh 
there was a lot of things I didn't know. I mean, I, I was, uh, I mean, he and I were like, were very close, but uh, I, a lot of things I discovered in the documentary. I kind of wished I'd known perhaps years before when we were around each other, you know, um, yeah. but uh, there we are. He was great. I loved him. So. That's good. That's good yeah. to hear. Um, what, uh, well, I asked Robert this question earlier. Uh, I think you were listening already. What do you think happened to Lester after the show? What was the rest of his life like? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think, I think, I think the Lester guy show might even less his last, <laughs> last chance, I think. Yeah. I don't think, I think, I cannot imagine any other area in the entertainment world. I'm not quite sure because, you know, we didn't I, have, he couldn't, he, he couldn't do, and it, there wasn't online, but yeah. he couldn't do his own little, he I actually think, podcast. I actually think anything. there I think is. His options were probably. What, uh, George, what do you think? What do you think? Happens? I actually think there's a slight hint in the series finale that we just, it was just on screen now when, when Lester dresses up as a candy machine. Um, <laughs> yes. I think that might have been a hint as like what else he, what his, what his options are. I think that might be where he, he returns to after the show is pulled off of the air. Well, also, I mean, he kind of, he tried his hand at, um, at uh, being a, mag a magician, but not very good mm -hmm. one. And, I mean, I, I, who knows, like, you know, the 50s, early 60s, when everything was about to explode. I don't know whether there'd be a place for somebody like Lester Guy. I'm not quite sure whether, yeah. I mean, I liked, you know, the whole, because it was fascinating, the whole beatnik, you know, thing, mm -hmm. like, you know, Lester was so hip and sure, the right. whole beatnik and let's, you know, go downtown and, you know, like, <laughs> let's go downtown and, and follow the scene, the beatnik scene. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know what he was. I, I mean, I have more of a sense of where uh, Dick Tremaine probably ended up kind of running like a two-bit model agency just, you know, <laughs> in the outskirts of Milan or someplace. That you know, sounds like great. very still in fashion, but not like, not cutting edge and not really like, yeah. you know, not the top of the game. But, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I think more about him than I do about Lester, actually, because I think, I don't know, because Lester had this life in every single episode that kind of had it. Like it, he started out so hopeful, and it was you know, then everything just was like so, right? Like you know, came to a crashing, resounding, like just sure. like so I, I, I don't know how often he could pick himself up. I, I right. really don't know. Yeah, I really do. I, I do wonder. By the time you get to the summer of love, what kind of condition Lester guy is in? <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, yes, totally. Yes, totally. I don't, I, either, I, either, either I could imagine him being completely repelled by it or totally giving into it and fully growing out his hair and, <laughs> and trying to trying to, to grasp onto the youth movement. Yeah, I, bet, I, I think he would probably dye his own hair. Yes. I think he yeah. would dye his own hair. He probably be, would dye his own his mustache. He dyed himself. He yeah. would yeah. be kind of like, I, I, I sort of, He'd be one of those sort of on the periphery of always on the periphery of, of maybe trying to grasp something and maybe trying to be like, you know, but just one beat behind that. I, yeah. I, I, I could imagine him like him trying by him. trying to fit in with the flower power movement, but secretly voting for Nixon, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that almost like taking the wig yeah. and the beard off when he got home to his nice house. Yeah. <laughs> um, now one of the, uh, one of the things looking what revisiting these episodes, I do feel like, and I hope this catches on. I do feel like uh, it's true of several characters on the show, but maybe you most of all, uh, the number of reaction shots where you just, you give a facial reaction that uh, expresses a complete uh, range of emotions. I feel like uh, the way people will go to certain, I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the reaction uh, gifs of like Denzel Washington expressing relief or uh, uh, right. uh, things like that. I feel like there is a wealth of Lester guy reaction, <laughs> like uh, mortified, frustrated, uh, angry. <laughs> there's, there's so many things that I feel like should catch on uh, yeah. if we can spread right. these gifs around because you're so good at giving the uh, uh, you know a, a spiteful expression with just a slight turn of the lip, just a slight. Uh, uh, there's so much like bubbling under the surface with this guy in terms of his 
his uh, <laughs> envy and his disappointment and uh, right. I think uh, yes I I I I definitely definitely uh, think that he he would like to give the impression he was in complete control but he was like had no control over anything whatsoever and yeah. every time he thought he was in control then something you know would just terrible he never, happen or, you know, he Betty, never completes you know, Betty had like you know had like had more had more understanding of what was going on than Lester ever did yeah and Lester was so narcissistic and so egomaniacal he didn't really see much of what was going on around him. So he never once he completes just... this opening dance sequence without uh, <laughs> it, there's so much pride in the, in the taking the moment to set the mood with that opening, that sort of noir dance sequence. And he never completes it. it, it <laughs> there's never a complete version of that, of that dance. Yeah. You know, I think, um, I think the, the thing with the, you know, the, the pilot, David directed the pilots, so Angelo mm -hmm. uh, Badalamenti was there during the pilot. And he was actually writing those great little songs, like as we were in rehearsal, we'd be in rehearsal. And also there was a wonderful choreographer who choreographed that opening number. And uh, after the choreographer had choreographed it and we shot the opening number for the pilot, I never saw the choreographer again. So every time we had to shoot months later the opening number, I would be kind of like, I can anybody, does anybody remember like what was apart from just the, this, the opening up of the world and the, this and the, you know, and I even had to go to Japan like to promote the show and they, to my horror, like I go like, you know, and I was, you know, just been on a plane and go to a television studio and walk in and they have the opening, they have the lamp thing all set up and, <laughs> Like they say, okay, now do dance the opening number. And I'm like, <laughs> are you people out of your minds? I can't. Like, <laughs> so I like, and they already had a suit that was similar and a hat that was similar. And I'm in the suit and the hat. I'm going, I can't. This is like, I can't even remember this. So, of course, I'll, you know, I'm just doing this and doing yeah. this, and doing this, and like, you know, all interpretive dance and running around the lamppost. And the Japanese were just, like, they just loved it. They would thought, yeah. I was like, this is, you know, I, so that, that dance number, I ha have no idea that morphed became, it became something I'd like to actually, I've never, I've never watched any of it, but I'd like to see how the, the wonderfully choreographed with the choreographer on set directed by David, yeah, how that compares to the final dance number that was ever shot. So it's got to be like, someone should make it. Someone David. should make a super cut of just the dance numbers. Yes, it up on yes YouTube. Exactly. I think that would be well, an e a, a, a very easily done. We can make that happen. Well, somebody, I, I that would be probably, uh, I'd prefer that, uh, that General Hospital, which I just went back to do, did a intercutting of every tango that Fennel Hughes and I did from <laughs> when we were in our 20s, right up till like uh, <laughs> two years ago. And they do the like the 20 year olds would like embrace and turn around and suddenly they'd be in their 50s and it was like the most oh horrendous i oh saw on television it was the most horrendous I, you go from like like a jawline to kind of three <laughs> chins and i was like why would they who could so that I, the lester guy dance at least only happened over yeah 12 a couple months, of years. Think, you're beautiful maybe. from start to finish it's, it's yeah. perfect. yes thank you thank you thank you so i could, I could, I could watch that was there uh was there any kind of i don't know the right way to phrase this acting uh learning curve going from soap operas to lynch world does that make sense yeah. i don't know if that... yeah that was for me because it was uh it was you know single camera which was yeah. you know and and you know i had uh with with multi cam i i think i think in between i think i did like a movie of the week a colombo so yeah, that was single camera. So I mean, I was only just, I was just really learning that. But the whole continuity thing was completely like uh, just uh, like a whole different ball game for me. Just a whole like a whole you know a whole different thing. And also, uh, um, you know, shooting four pages a day as opposed to you know fifty pages a day or sixty pages a day. Yeah. Fo just the focus was. Uh, and also comedy was great. You know, David Landers was was great. Like you know, like it's just like Chandling. David Landers kind of taught me like a lot about comedy. Like you know, just just uh, the the beats and you know and the rhythm of it. And um, so I mean, yeah, like learning still. Yeah. You know, it's like um, 
It's not like learning. Like this is learning. Sitting in my own home doing this sure. right now is like learning. You know, I just did a whole. I did a series, of eleven episodes of uh, shooting myself, my part at home. Oh so, wow! You know, the whole thing was just you know, it's all it's all learning and adapting. So, what one of, more thing. One more thing. Yeah. What was it like working on Colombo? So <laughs> that was great. Thank you. It was great. That was great. Yes, yes. Thank it you. was great. I loved him. I loved Peter Falk. He was just, he was great. It was a fun episode, actually. It was a different, it was definitely, a di I, I, it was a different departure for his character and also for the whole format and everything. So it was great fun. You know, everybody, they all took a chance on it and it worked and they took a chance on me and I guess it worked. But uh, it was a whole, uh, diff you know, he almost, he, I almost got away with it. You know, almost got away with uh, no. with the crime so yeah it was, uh, it was a lot of fun I had a great time for I that one final thing every day and i loved it it was great yeah there's a lot of great i'm looking at the imdb page yeah but that i mean it's so funny like uh like you know i i think it just showed up someplace and i saw it in that bracelet that you know it was supposed to be to have a digital you know kind of it was you know like an early like a beeper or something like yeah it's just so, so extraordinary i mean it was like a huge big it was like something that they put on you were under house arrest now i think it was just like <laughs> so like funny so funny um well the finale just ended so i guess i guess the question is what are your what are your last parting thoughts on on the air what do you want people to take away when they think of on the air well, we loved it. We, we had never, that was the thing that Miguel used to say, like, you know, we're not supposed to be this happy. <laughs> we're not supposed to be this happy at work. We loved it. We had a great time. I think we did many episodes. I think we did more than, I think there are three episodes nobody's seen, I believe. I'm not quite oh, wow. sure. I had the conversation with Nancy Ferguson all the time, and I think there were three, I think the, I think there were three episodes. I think, I'm sure we did more than, I mean, what are well, the, I believe there were seven, episode, seven, seven episodes, seven episodes, and and three of them aired on ABC. So there were four that never aired on ABC. But this is, but I don't know that there I were think any. We did a total. Loss. You think there were more? I think we did a total wow. of ten. I think. I believe wow! Did, yeah. This is this is a scoop coming late in the game for us, right at the yeah, end. No, I, no, I, I could, I could, I could definitely. I mean, I, I. I I believe we I, we definitely did more than more than um, I think oh. yeah the only air three <laughs> I remember that yeah remember yeah yeah, yeah. So. right uh, do you have any memories yeah, of working I don't, with uh, uh, I mean I wish people would rediscover it I mean everybody says it was before it's time but you know I don't know what that means I think it's I think uh, it's time I is think, now uh, people need to I think 2021 needs to be the year it becomes widely available either streaming or on a Blu-ray I, th I think it would be great to get everybody's memories on yeah I agree I think uh, you know I. Was just, I've just been watching Shit's Creek, and I, it reminds me a lot. A couple of episodes, depending on the director, I guess, reminds me a lot of Twin Peaks. It's like so yeah. bizarre. Just sometimes the whole sort of when they just you know the, you know just the motel and that whole milieu and that whole sort of it just kind of reminds me of, of the whole t of a twin you know just tw of a Twin Peaks vibe. So I think yeah, it'd be nice if people discovered it. I think it'd, yeah. be, it'd be great fun. It's even I mean, even just for the great Angelo. Battlementi original songs. songs. I mean, they were like you know, and I don't think there's 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 the one that we had great fun doing. It was Mr. Peanuts, yeah. but we were all singing Mr. Penis, which yeah. I don't. Um, you know, you can take your smile and turn it. You can take your frown and turn it upside down and turn it into a smile. And what's his name? It's Mr. Peanuts. Like and that's it's like they were great. They're great fun. Like you know, great. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ian, we, do, you have, are, do you have any fond memories of working with Snaps the dog? <laughs> uh, you know, Snaps the dog, I heard, passed away. But, of course, dogs do, don't they? Makes they, sense. They, makes sense. Right. I, it, would be, it, would be such an, it would be so alarming if he was still around. Still that would be alive. a major well, story, sure regardless, a, regardless yeah, of the TV if, show. If that would be news. If Korea, they would be, you know, Snaps 1, 2, 3, and 4. I, <laughs> snaps the dog was really sweet. It was a sweet little dog. I mean, I, I kind of – I didn't have much – I didn't hanging upside down with my head in the dog food. I really didn't have much time to think about the dog. Right, but uh, you had to hit your mark. The dog was very sweet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you had to hit your mark, which was your head right yeah, into so, that well, bowl I of dog no food. Saying that it was just you know like 
they just had to lure me onto my mark. So <laughs> yeah. But, um, I have to say it's been a it's been a rough year. The the image of your head going into the dog food has been increasingly relatable. You know, it is like I think I feel like we've all had that feeling uh, at some point in the past seven months. You know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, yeah. and I've been there. So I, it's, I've actually I've probably it hasn't been as bad for me as for a lot of people. I've having been there. Once you've been hanging upside down for three days and swinging through windows, and <laughs> yeah. I, going true. into it believing that it was supposed to be a stunt man and it never was, it was me. I was like, that was always you. On? Like, yes, it was me. yes, totally me. Wow. wow. Yes. I mean, to be yes. to be the leading man on a sitcom and to spend that much of it hanging hanging upside down in the pilot is I don't think anyone's beaten that record. There's no one else. Yeah. There's no other leading actor in any TV pilot who is upside down that much. Doesn't happen yeah, on like sure. Cast yeah. Cast yeah. Yeah, wow. I have to say, your your wherever you're at now, I assume this is your home, is very cheery. It's 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 actually brightening my mood to see uh, the way you've decorated behind you. That's a very bright and sunny uh, wall. Oh, yeah, well, the sun's still coming in. I uh, I thought because I'd been shooting that show here, I actually was trying to find a different angle because it's I I and I do like I do a play almost every Sunday. So mm-hmm. I had one certain part that I sort of, so I found I switched it up a little bit to try to like move it. But oh. it is cheery. It's very cheery. I, I love the way it looks. Yeah, uh, thank you. It's, uh... Ian, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a true delight. Oh, pl- thank you. My pleasure. I've enjoyed it immensely. Thank you yeah. all. George, nice to see you again. Next nice time to see I see you, again. you, perhaps you'll have a... something to give me. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. When my museum, you're in LA, right, Ian? Yes. I have a museum opening up in like a year or so. We should hang out. Oh, great. I'd love that. Yeah. I'd yeah. love that. Yeah. Friends. Great. George's hey, making nice fun. Nice to meet you, Ian. Nice to meet nice you. To meet I'm not you the also. job creator. Yes. All, All right. right. I we'll see you later, Thank Ian. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Enjoy Ian. the rest of uh, the, the week the, and the holiday. Have a good holiday coming up. Yeah. Thank you very much. With well. Great Let's pleasure. Take, Ian. Bye. Bye. Um, I can't imagine. I mean, we we've finished on the air. We've completed the whole Lynch watching portion of yeah. Our well done. That's it. Well done. Well done. Well, no, but I'm saying you know we're going to take a little jump from Lynch into Lucas now. No, but, not yet. But not not yet, Watto. Well, at the very least, we're about to change stream yards. Yes, that's true. And I've been so zen that I wasn't going to bring this up. I didn't want to embarrass you. You've been but really neither zen. of you. Thank you. I, I'm zen Watto. This is permanent. Yeah, I know. Nothing's going to break my cool. <laughs> but I've been very surprised that neither of you brought up the way I redecorated my apartment in honor of this week. Uh, is everything opposite of what it was? No. No. What is no, it? This is a, it's like when I redid my whole apartment for Halloween, you noticed, but you didn't notice my lynch redo. Is it? Oh, I see. I see it. Wada, what's that right next to you? I got some blue velvet. It's <laughs> <laughs> good. Let's, um, let's switch over StreamYard and we'll, uh, we'll be right back, guys. Sometimes you just got to sit on a joke for four hours to make George laugh.